good. <laughs> okay, can folks hear can folks hear me now? Yes, okay. thank you. All right, I'll try and be I'll try and be brief and um, and not rehash everything I just said. I'm Kyle Harris. Um, I grew up on the eastern shore of Maryland on a, on a small uh, red Angus farm. My dad's a veterinarian, mom's a dietitian. Always just really love the intersection of environmental issues and agricultural issues. I went to Vermont Law School. Um, and that's when I first came to Vermont, fell in love with it. Um, moved back to the DC thing for a number of years. I worked as an associate counsel for environmental affairs uh, for a trade association in DC. Um, I came back to Vermont, worked for the Agency of Agriculture. Um, I was an ag development specialist focusing on emerging issues and economic development. Um, business liaison to the hemp team, did a lot of policy development within that division of the Agency of Agriculture. Um, I saw this as, an, as a logical progression of my interests, both personally and professionally. Um, not too often you get to kind of help foster a program from a foundational level up and something that I, I care about, I'm passionate about, and um, fortunate to be here. Great. I'd like to just briefly introduce uh, our staff at the Cannabis Board, um, just so that you all can kind of put faces to names. Um, I'll start with our Executive Director, Bryn Hare. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bryn Hare. Um, I'll I'll just give you a brief background. Um, I grew up in Oregon. Um, I'm a lawyer. I started my legal career in New York working as a patent litigator at Ropes and Gray. Um, I moved to Vermont about 11 years ago and um, I spent most of that time working for the General Assembly as legislative counsel, working primarily on criminal justice reform issues. That's great. Um, Nellie, could you just introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm Nellie Marble. I'm the Administrative Services Coordinator here for the board. Um, you know, I come here from a background um, doing a lot of environmental policy work and um, uh, also similarly, most, most recently uh, with the State of Vermont Legislature as well uh, as a committee clerk there for a while. Um, I uh, have my master's degree in environmental studies um, concentrating in advocacy for social justice and sustainability. So I have a really um, strong, uh, passionate belief in making sure that we set up this system in a way that is uh, just, equitable, and sustainable. So glad to be here. Great. And uh, Kimberly? Yes. Hi. Good morning. My name is Kimberly Lashwa. I'm on day number two. <laughs> um, and so um, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I grew up in, in Montpelier. I spent some time um, in Texas shortly after I graduated from high school and back I came. Um, I've been uh, in the nonprofit world for 10 years prior um, or after, uh, excuse me, from there, I joined the Natural Resources Board and um, worked there for the last uh, almost eight years. And so I'm very happy to be part of this team and to um, help get us up and running and put some great systems in place. That's great. And we also have now hired a general counsel. Um, I don't know if uh, he's ready to kind of <laughs> talk to us about that role um, or his background. But it is David Scher, um, who's also an advisory committee member. So uh, if you know anyone with a criminal justice background, please let the attorney general know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We'll be uh, a couple of positions will be shifting here. So great to be here. Really excited. I'll be starting next Wednesday. Uh, sorry, uh, next the Monday after this coming Monday. Um, and I grew up in Vermont, um, went away for school, came back about also about 11 years ago and worked at a uh, firm for a while in Burlington and spent a number of years as a public defender. And for the last about four and a half years, I've been working at the attorney general's office doing criminal justice policy work of all kinds, uh, everything from work on issues of racial disparities in our criminal system to things like bail reform and expanding expungement. Um, so that work has been really great. Uh, I've really been grateful to be able to be involved in those issues, and I'm really excited to take some of that expertise and knowledge and commitment to equity that others have mentioned, and I'm grateful to hear uh, and bring that to the board and begin working on setting up this market. So I'm really excited to join this board and, and all of you here today. 
we're very lucky to have you. I mean, your resume, we could go into deeper, but we won't today. <laughs> um, but uh, so if I, if I could, I'd like the advisory committee members to just briefly introduce themselves um, and uh, either talk very quickly about why you decided to take on this very important responsibility or um, what issues are of most concern to you as we kind of embark on this new venture. And to help facilitate that, I'll, I'll call your name um, and you can, and I'll say what, what, your, what your statutory position is and who appointed you. So um, Stephanie Smith, are you on the call? Stephanie Smith is the Secretary of Agriculture, Food or Markets designee. Hi, I'm Stephanie Smith. I work for the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. Um, I'm currently the manager of the Vermont Hemp Program within the Agency of Agriculture. Um, why I took on this responsibility uh, is because I, I, you know, working in the hemp world and knowing that um, at least a portion of our registrants will be involved in the legal cannabis market, um, I thought I had some connections to offer, maybe some information to offer um, as well. Uh, what is most important to me uh, as a, a member of state government is that the, the process and the permitting and the systems and the licenses we design are accessible to all users and that we provide um, uh, great customer service and that the products that are produced in the state of Vermont are of a quality um, that uh, represents the state of Vermont. So that's my interest. Thanks. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Kim Watson is a member with expertise in laboratory science appointed by the governor. Hi, I'm Kim Watson. I've been with, um, I've been interested in the cannabis industry since about 2015, working with the state of Oregon on training samplers um, in how to get representative samples and also have worked 19 years for Stone Environmental, recently retired um, and worked 20 years for Environmental Lab. So that's my interest in laboratory testing <laughs> and the quality assurance thereof. Yeah. Um, Nader Hashim is uh, a member with expertise in systemic social justice and equity issues appointed by the Speaker of the House. Nader, are you here with us? Yep, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, so I came to Vermont in around 2010, served as a Vermont State Trooper for about seven and a half years. Uh, after that stint with the Vermont State Police, got elected to office, um, served as a state representative on the Judiciary Committee and currently working at a law firm in Brattleboro, uh, primarily on civil rights cases. Um, social equity and criminal justice reform are um, the bigger parts of my focus on this, and I'm uh, looking forward to contributing. Thanks, Nader. Uh Ashley Reynolds, uh, a member with expertise in women and minority-owned business ownership appointed by the Speaker of the House. Good morning, okay. everyone. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm the president and co-founder of Elmer Mountain Therapeutics. We were founded in May of 2017 um, with a heavy emphasis on safe access and education for women and mothers. Um, we've grown our cannabis business from the ground up. We know what it takes to have excellent sourcing at every link in the supply chain. We've developed one of the most comprehensive testing programs for quality assurance and safety for any CBD consumable product coming out of Vermont. Uh, my company's huge focus and our mission statement is on well-being, economic development, social justice, and environmental sustainability. I was recently just named 2021's um, VBSR uh, Young Changemaker Award, and our uh, company definitely aligns extremely with VBSR's values um, and growing a business that is really, uh, really tangible for the Vermont people and the Vermont market. Um, why I care so deeply about wanting to be on this committee? I need another job like I need a hole in the head trying to run a cannabis business in a brand new market. But I think that unique Vermont has something really unique to offer. I think that we're the crown jewel for the U.S. cannabis market. And I, I feel really strongly about bringing the voice of someone who's been in the trenches of it for the last five years and what I can offer for what it's really like, really like for, you know, boots on the ground people like me. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Ashley. Um, Dr. Levine, are you on? He was just on NPR. He was on the radio. Yeah, <laughs> I was just on a drive. Yeah. 
All right. I'll skip. Are you here? Yeah. Oh, great. So Dr. Levine is actually filling two positions currently while um, one of our advisory committee members is out on leave. But um, I think you're here mostly as the chair of the Substance Misuse Prevention and Oversight Advisory Council. Great. Um, <laughs> like I needed another job too. Uh, <laughs> but um, my main interest really is uh, in the public health aspects and in the preventive aspects and uh, I think they could all be summarized as protecting kids brains. So that is where my strongest focus will be uh, and in making sure that all the public health uh, guidance that <clears throat> we provided throughout the cannabis uh, programming etc does truly get integrated into the system that's developed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levine, and thanks for all your service to the state over the last, well, your entire career, but thank you. Um, Chris Walsh is one member with expertise in cannabis industry appointed by the Senate Committee on Committee. Chris, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Hi everyone, um, pleasure to be here, honored to be involved in such an esteemed group. <clears throat> I moved up to Vermont from New York City in 2003 and purchased Nectars, which gave me 15 years of experience in another regulated market. Um, in 2015, I segued into cannabis by starting uh, a, the first grow store in Burlington, Vermont and also a CBD company, Upstate Elevator Supply Company, uh, which was kind of spawned out of Green State Gardener. Um, I then was asked to run one of the MSO's assets in Brandon, Vermont. Grassroots was the name of the dispensary, uh, you know, for the vertically integrated license that Ianthus run. Um, I did that for two years and did not enjoy it at all. I call myself an escapee of MSOs. Um, I segued that into a, I spent the last year and a half in Jamaica um, consulting on a cannabis and hemp grow um, in conjunction with the University of West Indies um, that was doing a lot of studies on terpenes and cannabinoids in their medical school. And from there, I took a job with my old COO from Ianthus, who started a really ground changing um, agricultural technology company that can wipe out pathogens in an organic, non toxic matter uh, way. And I took that job because I think it's such a noble cause. And I've also simultaneously been consulting with Ben Cohen on his new pre-roll company, <clears throat> which has a strong social equity, social responsibility angle where it's all the proceeds from the company are going to go to expunging minority cannabis records in each state that, that we have accounts in. So that's just a quick overview. Thank, thank you, Chris. Um, Sivan Kodal is a member with expertise in business management or regulatory compliance appointed by the treasurer. Hey everyone, Sivan Kotel. Uh, my first career was in finance and business in New York. I spent the last decade here in Vermont uh, running two distilleries. I was the COO and CFO of Whistle Pig Whiskey and then the co-founder of Stonecutter Spirits. And over that decade, I was heavily involved in Vermont's alcohol regulatory policy, um, including the rewrite of Title VII, a lot of work in the legislature, so I think Treasurer Pierce uh, appointed me for keeping a perspective on regulatory matters and, and really trying to keep things, my personal view is try to keep them practical. Whatever we decide, there's no right or wrong answer, but it needs to be uh, useful in the real world that people who are applying for licenses can easily understand what they need to do, that things are clear, that they're actually reasonable and, and you know can be consistent. So that, that's really the perspective I try to bring. Thank you. Um, Tim Wessel, uh, one member with an expertise in municipal issues appointed by the Committee on Committees. Hi, everybody. Nice to see everybody. Uh, 
Yes, my name is Tim Wessel, and I'm on the uh, fifth year of the Brattleboro Select Board. I've been elected three times and uh, served as chair and vice chair throughout that time. And I'm here to represent the interests of <clears throat> interests and concerns, I should say, of municipalities. Uh, Vermont towns uh, have direct interest in how these effects will roll out on the ground when we get to these this marketplace. Um, I have no real personal interest in cannabis, but I think my service as a local liquor commissioner will uh, inform a lot of my comments and decisions making as we move forward with um, how local governments are going to interface with state government uh, on the ground. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Um, next, we have Ingrid Jonas is a member with expertise in public safety appointed by the attorney general. Hi, everyone. Um, happy to be here. I um, I grew up in Vermont, and my first sort of career was um, working with survivors of domestic and sexual violence, um, and also those who had committed those types of crimes. I then um, became a state trooper and just recently retired after 23 years with the Vermont State Police. So I was honored to be asked to be part of this great group. Um, my Sort of, I think what will inform my participation is really sort of safety um, impairment and that type of thing. Um, I did spend quite a bit of time in state police as a detective um, and also doing work to ensure racial equity and um, access to uh, safety services. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. We're happy to have you. Um, We've already spoken to David. Um, he currently is a member with expertise in criminal justice reform appointed by the Attorney General. Um, I'll move to Billy Coster, the Secretary of Natural Resources uh, designee. Uh, good morning, I'm Billy Coster. I'm the Director of Planning for the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. Uh, my work focuses on land use, energy, land use and energy planning policy, legislative and regulatory matters. Uh, I also have a background in working farm and forest land conservation. Um, my main interest here is just to share the resources and capacity of our agency um, and ensure that we develop a industry that is sustainable and to the extent, greatest extent possible as beneficial to our working land owners and managers. Thanks. Thanks, Billy. Um, next is Jim Romanoff, the chair of the Cannabis for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee. Morning. Uh, I'm Jim Romanoff. Uh, I have grew up in southern New England. I've lived in Vermont for coming on 30 years. Uh, most of my career has been in the publishing business uh, as an editor, uh, mostly in New York City and up here most recently for Eating Well Magazine for a long time. Um, I've been the chair of the Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee for uh, the past year, and I've been a board member for the last five years. Uh, it's an amazing program. Uh, 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 I have a, a medical card. It's helped a lot of people. It runs smoothly. It's safe. Uh, my goal this year with our board has been to continue oversight into the uh, future with the new adult use marketplace. It can be a perilous time for uh, medical programs, so we're really encouraged <clears throat> by everything that's been done to make sure uh, that we're part of this conversation and that we can have continued uh, high quality products and uh, safe products uh, at a fair and equitable price that anybody can uh, who's got a medical card can get their hands on uh, into the future so that Vermont uh, continues to be sort of a state of the art medical program. That's great. Thanks, Jim. And finally, we have Meg Delia, and she's a member appointed by the Vermont Cannabis Trade Association. Hi, uh, thank you, of course. And um, I grew up in Vermont. I have been in Massachusetts uh, for the past, oh gosh, well, I've been here for five years. Pr prior to that, I was in Massachusetts where I did my uh, master's in public health. That's actually where I got started working in the cannabis industry. Uh, I worked with a research startup. Now I work with VCTA and um, kind of like Jim, our focus is absolutely just on a sustainable medical program, one that uh, ties well into the adult use and is supported by it rather than squandered by it. That's great, thank you. 
So that is our full advisory committee. Um, I'd like, we, we have one person who's on leave, uh, Shayla Livingston. She's a um, expert in public health and um, she'll be joining us later in the fall. Until then, Dr. Levine is gonna fill in for that position as well. Um, we have two consulting firms that we've hired um, to help us craft the kind of basic contours of this new industry. Um, I think you'll find as they review kind of the subcommittee structure and the next step that there really are endless complexities to, and permutations to how this market might look. Um, and as much as we really want to kind of, we might, there might be a desire to just copy and paste um, from other states wholesale. I think um, we should push back against that desire. Um, one, we have a number of priorities that are in our bill, um, Act 164, and we'll walk through those a little bit later. Um, and we wouldn't really be honoring those priorities if we just kind of took what other states have done. Um, and two, you know, Vermont really needs to focus on its competitive advantages um, and our values as we kind of move towards federal legalization and our state borders will no longer be a barrier to the importation of cannabis from, you know, these mega grows in Oregon or Colorado or Massachusetts. So we hired two firms. Um, that uh, are made up of former cannabis regulators, economists, subject matter experts um, in the various facets of cannabis policy. They are gonna break you up into subcommittees and they're going to provide you with all the background and expertise and comparison charts from other states and other jurisdictions and help uh, you develop recommendations for the board and then help stress test those recommendations and make sure that they could work within our, our state and, and our agencies. So there I'm gonna pause, I'm not gonna to get too far ahead of them and I turn it over for them to introduce themselves. Um, I think I'll start with VS Strategies, Vincente Cedarberg Strategies, because um, NACB has a presentation for us and I think it makes sense for, for you guys to start um, and then kick things over to uh, the National Association of Cannabis Businesses. That sounds great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I uh, just want to say how excited we are uh, to be working with the board, um, to be working with all of these uh, great members of the advisory board that, that were introduced today and to be working with uh, NACB on all of this. I think, I think we all share uh, a common goal that's been brought up a few times uh, so far that we're trying to create a, an inclusive cannabis system in Vermont that uh, recognizes and emphasizes the the things that make Vermont uh, unique and special. Um, so uh, we're really excited to, to, to be going uh, forward working with you. Um, a little bit more about who we are. Um, VS Strategies is a, uh, a policy and public affairs consulting firm that specializes in cannabis policy. Um, you know, we're, we think of ourselves as experts in cannabis policy, although some people just call us uh, policy nerds. Um, our, our clients include governmental bodies, trade associations, businesses, and, and other organizations seeking to shape um, seeking to shape public opinion and, and implement the most effective uh, cannabis policies and laws and regulations. Um, personally, uh, or I guess I should introduce myself first. I'm Dan Smith. Um, my specialty at VS Strategies is, um, is basically working on state level policies around the country. Um, I work in many different states uh, and, and trying to figure out the, the best way to advance cannabis policy in a dynamic, uh, equitable, and, and responsible man manner. Um, uh, the, the, the team that we put together here, though, isn't just limited to BS strategies. We also um, have pulled in folks from uh, Vicente Cedarberg, which is our uh, affiliated law firm. Um, uh, BS uh, has been at the leading edge of, of cannabis law and policy since the first regulated markets came into place in in Colorado. Um, you know they pride themselves on not just helping clients navigate the the laws and regulations, but um, also shaping those laws. and And they share that same goal of of uh, advancing um, equitable and responsible policies um, uh, across the country. So, um, I think one thing to note just about the team that we put together and. I'll let everybody. Um, I'll let everybody uh, introduce themselves in a second. Um, but um, the team that we put together here has uh, four out of the five members um, came from 
came from a government background before. Um, so I think we know the sorts of problems and questions that, that the, the board's going to be facing and that the advisory board needs to answer. Um, so uh, I came to the board, uh, I mean, I came to VS Strategies from um, the, the Massachusetts legislature, where I was kind of the main staffer on the adult use bill um, on the Senate side. So I had to shepherd that kind of through the Senate, negotiating with the House um, and, and um, all of my other colleagues on this team, um, Jen, who I'll probably introduce in a, in a second, um, was also in the Senate at the time and then went on to, to work at the Cannabis Control Commission. So um, we kind of have faced these same problems that, um, that you're going to have to answer now. Um, and so I think we can help pull in best practices from, from around the country, but make sure that we can um, tweak and tailor them uh, in a way that, that works best for, for Vermont. So um, I guess that's probably enough from, from me right now, and I'll, I'll start turning it over to the rest of the team to introduce themselves. So um, why don't we start uh, just, we'll start with Jen since she's the first one I, I see on, on camera, and then, then we'll move around the horn. Thank you, Dan. So my name is Jen Flanagan. I am a former regulator with the Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commission. I was the governor's appointee as the public health commissioner. Um, you may know that Massachusetts has a very prescriptive commission. Each one of the five mem members had to have a specific background. My specialty was public health. Uh, prior to that, I spent nine years in the Massachusetts State Senate, where I was the chairman of the Mental Health, Substance Abuse and Recovery Committee, also the Vice Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee and held ver various roles in, in public health. Uh, prior to that, I spent four years in the House of Representatives um, and pr 10 years prior to, with 10 years after, before that, I was a legislative staffer. So my entire career has been in government, um, understanding that what happens on Main Street is really the important piece of any legislation. Um, I started with VS as the director of regulatory policy. I worked with various states on really enacting best practices. I think as each state continues to legalize adult use cannabis, it's been really important to understand that while there are distinct differences between the states, there's a lot of similarities. And so best practices that can be used um, are very helpful. Um, also, as a, as a side note, I will be up in Vermont on September 23rd presenting at the Vermont Youth Cannabis Conference up in Montpelier. So I've been we're doing a lot of work in substance abuse throughout my entire career and really want to make sure that we can help Vermont um, do what they need to do to stand up this agency right, to make sure that the market is regulated, but also the fact that we, um, we can get it right and we can do it for the people of Vermont. And maybe uh, Jordan next. Uh, thanks, Dan. I'm Jordan Wellington. I'm a partner at the firm VS Strategies. Um, after serving as a bill drafter in the New Jersey State Legislature, I moved to Colorado and kind of through a series of accidental circumstances ended up being put in charge of implementing the first ever adult use cannabis system. Uh, first on behalf of the Colorado General Assembly and then on behalf of the Colorado Marijuana Enforcement Division. So I carried, carried uh, legalization through the through the legislature and then the regulatory agency. Uh, in 2014, I left public service for the first time in my career and joined uh, first the Vicente Cedarberg Law Firm and helped create a lot of the regulatory practices there and then uh, shifting over to VS Strategy so I could do public policy work full time. Um, I oversee both our national uh, strategic kind of uh, clients who and do government affairs work all across the country and then work very closely on a lot of different things here in Colorado. Um, and I'm happy to torque out about all kinds of regulations and all the stuff that I do. But I think what I really want to share is uh, having grown up in New Jersey, I grew up going to Vermont all the time as a child. My brother went to the University of Vermont um, and I just have a tremendous and deep passion for the state. Uh, for the people there and really for the vision behind the legalization and, uh, bill that was passed and the way to make something that is really uniquely Vermont and cannot begin to even express how excited I am to work on creating a regulatory system that is designed um, in that in that name and not just to copy and paste stuff from other states, but to make something that uniquely fits the culture, the community, the economy and the geography in Vermont and really am thrilled to be a part of this and thank you.
And Michelle, you can jump in next. Thanks, Jordan. Hi, Michelle Bodian. I'm an attorney with the law firm side of things, Vicente Cedarberg, I'm out of our Boston office currently. Well, currently my home office, but you know what I mean. Um, and I came to VS from Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources, was with the state for about five years. Before that, I was with a traditional environmental law firm in Connecticut. And here at VS, you know, I really work on the intersection of all things hemp and marijuana. You know, it's it's one plant. There's a lot of lessons that can be learned. There's a lot of issues of using a hemp ingredient in a marijuana dispensary. Um, you know, a hemp farmer is very excited about growing a new crop, growing marijuana, but a lot of considerations about land that you know is protected with federal dollars or you know is zoned in a particular way um, and really helping to understand that intersection very excited to help support where i can and work on all things vermont so i'll turn it over to my colleague andrew to round out our crew thank you michelle and um, thank you to to the uh the board as well so my name is andrew livingston i'm the director of economics and research at vicente cedarburg um, I also do quite a bit of work for VS Strategies as well. My background is in economics and environmental studies, um, but really I've been researching, analyzing cannabis markets uh, my entire career, having worked uh, at the law firm for the last eight and a half years, um, studying cannabis laws as they develop, assisting clients and um, public uh, entities, uh, localities, with all sorts of different ranges of, um, of needs when it comes to market sizing, demand and supply analysis, navigating the complex patchwork of different state cannabis laws. Um, and so really, you know, looking forward to assisting the, the board as well as the advisory groups on, on all sorts of different things when it comes to comparative analyses of different state laws, as well as understanding the different nuances of uh, cannabis laws and how those affect market size and structure. Uh, and I will be putting together um, a relatively robust uh, market analysis uh, for the board, which hopefully will be coming soon. Thanks so much. So I, I'm happy to uh, turn yeah, so to NACB or if, Oh no, you can go. I was just gonna I was just gonna turn it over. But uh, yeah, that that's the team. Thank you very much. Uh, we're really excited to be working uh, with all of you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, you guys really are uh, give us a lot of comfort that we're gonna do kind of make good decisions and um, you know, uh, great to have you on board. Um, I see Gina and I see Tom, who are the two principals at um, the CEO and the legal counsel at NACB. So I'd like to hand things over to them. Well, first of all, I just want to say we are so excited to be here. NACB can't wait to get started with the subcommittee groups to really go over um, the scope of work and, you know, help to make recommendations of what Vermont law for cannabis should look like. We're really enjoying this process. You know, Vermont is a really unique state and we get to work on some interesting projects that um, are unlike any other states with, you know, some cultivation or farm to consumer ideas. Um, so this is really gonna be a passion project for, for many of us. Um, for those of you who don't know, NACB, we create best practices for the cannabis industry with industry experts. Um, we provide a blueprint to a lot of legislators out there to say what would be some great work that they can add to their cannabis legislation industry that they have right now. And we play a lot of leading roles um, in researching and recommending social equity to pe benefit the individuals on this war on drug. Also, just to give you a little bit of background on how we create a standard, it's very similar to what we'd be doing here in Vermont, which you know is the the initial one is just identifying the issue and the topic, getting an industry expert to start helping us and along with our research and comparison analysis of different states, different industries, or even sometimes different countries, collecting a panel of experts 
in order for us to really start that collaboration? You know, how can we fully comprehensively design this? Um, and then when we have our first draft, we go to our standards governance board, which is made up of all of our members, but also our own advisory um, advocacy board. We have over 700 members right now, stemming from all parts of the industry, all different sectors, but all different groups. One of the things that is very important to NACB is to ensure that all voices are heard. Um, a lot of community groups right now in Vermont have been on calls with us because that is one of the things that we want to ensure that these regulations are geared for that. Um, and then once we have review on that, we have an open public comment period for two weeks. And then we will revise based on that open comment and then have all of our members vote everything into law. Um, so very similar to the process that we will be doing here in Vermont. And it is going to be done really quickly. I know that we have a lot of standards and scope of work that needs to be completed in the next few months. I met a lot of the board yesterday. I'm really excited. All of the experts for the advisory committee have amazing experiences, a wealth of information to obtain, and all of the NACB um, consultants that will be on each of the panels are really excited to meet them. And I will send this over to Tom to give us an introductory of what those subcommittees will look like and our staff that will be leading the way on that. Tom? Thanks, Gina. Um, I'll, I'll keep my introduction as brief as I can uh, because I've, I think I've met most of the, the folks uh, that are on this call. I'm Tom Nolasco, uh, General Counsel for the NACB, or the Director of Legal Strategies. Uh, yet another attorney um, in this group this morning. Um, I, I, I draft uh, the standards for the NACB um, and along with Mark and, and, and Gina and some others, we consult with various state legislators and, and municipalities. So what, uh, what we have done, and, and we've started working um, with BS Strategies and, and Dan and, and Jen already, is we've, based on Act 164 and what we're charged with and the, the quickly approaching deadlines, we've kind of distilled uh, what needs to be done into seven different subcommittees uh, that you'll see here. Um, social equity, market structure, licensing, sustainability, public health, compliance and enforcement, medicinal, product safety, uh, and then we'll, we'll also speak about exploratory um, as well. And uh, Gene and I, uh, through, through the board and through Chairman um, Pepper and Bryn, we were able to meet with, uh, I think, most of the advisory committee members on each section. Um, the purpose of today is to help uh, everyone understand the other groups, the other subcommittees that are out there that exist, because eventually uh, all of these reports and recommendations are going to have to be approved by the advisory committee and the board as a whole. So we'll probably go through these pretty quickly. Um, just to, to start off, uh, the first subcommittee, social equity. Danique, if we could get to that slide. And I'm sorry, if we could go back to Nika, I will go through and introduce the team. Um, uh, Gina, you've just met. Uh, Jeffrey, everyone should be on the call. Uh, another attorney, our research attorney, um, and all of our, our subcommittees are, are marked under there. Mark Gorman, um, also on the calls, are our uh, chief government relations officer, uh, his background is from discus, from the al alcohol spirits industry. Danica, who most of you met on the calls yesterday, is our uh, chief executive of marketing communications and strategy. Uh, Dr. Mary Clifton, also on the call, who will be on medicinal. Um, she's a doctor, uh, also licensed in Vermont, um, helping out with medicinal and does uh, a lot of programs for the NACB uh, that you can also attend. Jacob Pulitzer, also on the call, will be doing sustainability. I'll let him introduce himself when we talk 
about that subcommittee. Ashley Manning, our COO, um, will be on compliance enforcement, uh, has a lengthy background uh, in the cannabis industry, and Eli Harrington, uh, who most of you might know, is also in Vermont and will be consulting with us as well. So uh, the first subcommittee that uh, we want to talk about is social equity. Gina, if you want to discuss um, what you and Jeffrey and, and the rest of the team will be handling. Definitely. Thank you, Tom. Um, Jeffrey, um, can you just say a quick hello? Just want um, the board to, to view you since we'll be dealing with them a lot in the next few months. Hello, my name is Jeffrey Gallegos. I'm an attorney in California, Los Angeles, and a career musician. And so I have a experience mainly through music. Uh, cannabis has a way of finding us musicians. So uh, I have experience just as a just from a, like a ground level. And then I've spent a good chunk of my life living in what would be considered a disproportionately impacted area of cannabis prohibition. And so I bring kind of more of a ground level expertise in that area. And I'm looking forward to help uh, collaborate and create a sustainable and inclusive cannabis industry. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. And Jeffrey will be great on these phone calls. When they get a little bit too heavy, he can turn on some music for us. He has a great soundtracks for us every day. And he also does our Blazers and Blazers as our host, where we are trying to create um, the cannabis industry with the finance industry. So just um, to note on social equity, we have quite a great team. Um, we have Nader, who's going to be on there, Ashley. And David, I know you will only be there to the end of the year. I've heard some great things about you. Um, so, so can't wait to meet you. And we have even more resources within the state of Vermont who we will be consulting with in creating um, social equity. So Susanna Davis, who is the executive director of racial equity and diversity for the state of Vermont and Lindsay Curley, um, both of the people we have met last week and we'll be also meeting this week as well, um, who's been very helpful in giving some ideas around social equity and what they're thinking about and also what has been done in Vermont so far. So this, what we'll be primarily in charge of for this subcommittee is the program design. You know, who are the social equity licensees? what does a disproportionate impact or impacted person looks like a group? Um, you know, what should their fees be? What should their tax or uh, tax structure look like? Um, but also the ongoing program. And one of the things that we hope to do in the subcommittee is not just to look at a licensee candidate, but how can social equity be involved in the industry and in its totality. You know, how do we get level entry positions for social equity candidates? Um, how can cannabis tax revenue help these the dis disproportionately impacted areas? And so I'm truly, truly excited, you know, getting to the root cause of any problem and be able to help that shift. Um, it's just such an amazing reward um, to be able to partake in. One of the things that I have greatly seen by Vermont with everybody that I speak with from the Cannabis um, Control Board, the advisors, the community outreach that I've seen, the state of Vermont, they are so concerned about their social equity program and they really want to get it right. They want to help um, people and are willing to take the necessary steps and design a program that will do so. So that in my mind is we've already accomplished the first step in making change. So it's gonna be really exciting to see. We have some quick due dates. October 1st, we have to, is our first due date, you know, what is that social equity applicant look like? You know, are we reducing or eliminating the fees? Um, what Also, what are tax structures? October 15th, 
is definitely more in depth on there. You know, what is this loans and grants from the cannabis business development fund that has been established for social equity going to look like? What's the percentage? Who who's going to get that? And then in November, once we have written a draft of what a social equity program looks like, you know, really going out into the community and, you know, discussing with them what do these social equity candidates need in order to be successful in the industry and, you know, meet and greets, you know, having maybe some co-design around if we give tax revenue back, where it's the best placement, you know, meeting the people, hearing their story, really being able to have a really wide develop change and bringing those people along and showing our support to them. So I'm truly, truly excited and blessed to be a part of that subcommittee. Thanks, Gina. If uh, we can move to the next subcommittee, so market structure, licensing, taxes, and fees. Um, uh, b before I, Dan, if you wanted to just give an overview on this, um, I'm happy to do that or, or I can take it. But before I do that, I just want to introduce uh, Mark Gorman as well, um, who will be assisting myself and, and Jeffrey. Uh, Mark, if you just want to give a little intro about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I'm uh, Mark Gorman. I'm the executive vice president and the chief government officer for uh, NACB. Um, did not grow up in Vermont, but uh, did go to college just two miles south of the uh, uh, the border in uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, it's a it's a beautiful place. Uh, really look forward to uh, working with the the board and the advisory committee on. on uh, uh, you know, uh, an overall program that that works for uh, for Vermont, and uh, we're of course taking our lead on this uh, subcommittee from Dan and, and Jen, and uh, we'll have an opportunity to make our input based on our our own experience and and um, knowledge of the industry, and um, look look forward to uh, look forward to that process. It's uh, start it's it's underway now. Thanks, Mark. And, and as I said, we've started working with with VS Strategies, Dan and Jen, and their team on this. Dan, did you would you mind just giving a quick? Yeah, I can just go ahead. Yeah, happy happy to do that for a second. Um, yeah, we're what we're in the process of doing right now, and this is mostly led by Andrew on our team, is is completing a a, a full market analysis to try to estimate the um, the the size and 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 scope of the Vermont market going forward um, based on uh, a bunch of data, both uh, public data and then the the board and others in Vermont have been great about providing information that will help try to make this uh, this analysis more accurate. So um, Andrew's been hard at work at that and is hopeful to have that wrapped up uh, relatively soon, um, which we'll share with uh, with everyone on on the call and the advisory board. And um, so we're kind of using that as the baseline to to try to to figure out kind of what the fee revenue will be, what the tax revenue will be, how to structure the licenses properly based on kind of what um, demand in, in Vermont will be. So um, we are, I guess my update right now is that we're working on it. Hopefully we'll have something very soon because uh, we've been working on it for the last few weeks. Um, and, um, you know, as soon as we have kind of that that piece done, that's when we can really dive into the, the substance of, of um, figuring out the the market structure and, and the licensing structure. So um, we'll keep you all posted and, and share everything as soon as we finish it up. Great, thank you, Dan. Obviously, that's a that's a quick deadline coming up as well. Um, some important decisions uh, on the licensing and, and the structure and the amount. And obviously, they'll, they'll be working with social equity um, because those licenses will be dependent on, on that that market structure and, and licensing uh, as well. So to the next subcommittee, uh, we have public health uh, with Danica on our team and, and Mark uh, from the NACB. Uh, we spoke with Tim Wessel yesterday uh, about uh, the importance and the interest uh, in this section. Looking forward to working with uh, Dr. Levine and Ingrid on this as well. This will cover 
items such as the marketing and advertising, packaging and labeling, which the NACB has uh, some best practices uh, that are available on our website. Um, and then obviously edibles uh, and oversight. So um, that's, that's also coming up uh, quickly as well. Um, and we look forward to diving into that um, just in the next couple of weeks um, and getting those subcommittee meetings going. The next subcommittee is sustainability. And we are working actually with uh, Jacob Pulitzer on this, who I don't think um, many of you have met yet. So I wanted to give him an opportunity to give an introduction and a little bit about what we are going to be covering in this subcommittee group. Jacob, is that okay with you? Uh, that's perfect. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, thank you to the board and uh, all the advisory uh, panels for uh, having me here today. Uh, so I'm Jacob Pulitzer. I'm the co-founder and director of uh, Science and Strategy for the Cannabis Conservancy. Uh, we focus um, specifically on uh, sustainability and environmental impact mitigation of cannabis cultivation um, in the cannabis industry. I've been doing that for the last seven years. Uh, my background is in um, urban agriculture, uh, wildlife conservation, um, and um, uh, sustainability uh, for, for international uh, companies. Um, I have my master's in environmental science policy and management uh, through European Union Consortium of Universities. Um, and uh, yeah, before I got into looking at sustainability in the cannabis industry, um, I also worked for the South Florida Water Management District looking at agricultural pollution and uh, ecosystem service um, benefits. Um, and then uh, also did a, uh, a lot of permaculture and uh, urban agricultural work. Um, and yeah, have been focusing um, specifically on sustainability, energy, water, waste, uh, cultivation practices um, in the cannabis industry for the last seven years. We currently um, have standards on sustainability, uh, carbon conscious, so carbon emissions and carbon uh, mitigation, um, as well as regenerative practices looking at um, uh, worker rights um, on par with kind of fair trade as well as community engagement and best practices with that. Um, really uh, looking forward to working with uh, Billy, Kim and Stephanie and all these esteemed colleagues. Your, your backgrounds are uh, very impressive. And um, what we'll be focusing on with the sustainability subcommittee really is looking at kind of energy, water, waste, cultivation practices. Um, I'm really keen on finding Vermont solutions to this and looking at their, um, the 2020 Global Warming Solutions Act and looking at how the cannabis industry um, will, can sequester carbon and enhance ecosystem services, knowing that kind of 16% of Vermont's emissions currently is from the agricultural industry. So we can show that we're not contributing more than we need to. Um, and then hopefully, in fact, um, having a uh, uh, mitigated prop, um, properties with that. And then, you know, with energy as well, looking at kind of uh, equipment efficiency, uh, building envelope um, efficiency and, and uh, um, clean kind of heating requirements. Um, and specifically with kind of the urban landscape that we see in Vermont, um, finding solutions to kind of the, the split dilemma of uh, between the building owner and operators uh, that we see kind of uh, across the country and, and finding a good solution for that. Um, you know, with water, it's definitely the service and groundwater uh, extraction, uh, water quality testing requirements, and then the discharge um, effluent potential uh, with the nutrient load um, that may come from some uh, cultivation facilities, um, as well as extraction. Um, and then with waste, um, I think there's definitely a big opportunity in Vermont to look at the kind of pre-waste generation and uh, aligning kind of the public health concerns with the child restraint packaging. Um, as well as kind of the uh, um, landfill um, diversion um, that we would hope to see um, for that. Um, and then as well as like kind of biomass collection and uh, re reuse and recyclability um, of all products and then kind of end use um, uh, extended, uh, let's say producer uh, responsibility. Um, yeah, and then as well as just in general, looking forward to uh, creating kind of best practices and, and acting it into law. Um, in regards to kind of the testing requirements um, that were discussed previously. And uh, I would say kind of on a whole, what we're looking at for sustainability is to kind of keep it on bar with uh, all of the other committees um, and it's just ensuring kind of clarity with uh, the expressed intent processes and implementation of all regulations uh, that recommendations that we come up with. So. 
hand it back to you, Tom. Thanks, Jacob. And I know if um, you had more time, you could go on for, for days on, on a lot of this. Uh, but Jacob's obviously abundantly qualified, uh, as are Billy Coster, Kim Watson, Stephanie Smith, who enjoyed our conversations yesterday. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to um, seeing what this committee can do in the short time frame. Uh, Janika, if we could go to the next subcommittee, um, what I also call the Goliath Committee um, in my own head at night. So this is compliance and enforcement. Uh, and Ashley, uh, Mark and I from the NACB. Ashley, if you just wanted to, to give a quick introduction, um, I'm not sure how many of the advisory committee members or board members have, have met you yet. Sure. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I'm Ashley Manning. I'm the COO of the NACB and been in the cannabis industry for about five years now. In the past two and a half years, I've spent with the NACB. Um, prior to the NACB, I've worked in each vertical um, during the transition in California market from medical to adult use. And with my experience during that time, I realized that regulation sometimes is not enough and wanted to uh, work outside of the supply chain and work to improve the industry overall. And that's where I took my experience of what I've learned, uh, what I saw, and applied that to what we are, the work that we're doing at the NACB. So I'm very excited to work along with Tim, Ingrid, uh, Ashley, and I believe Carrie Gigwire as well. Uh, so that is my brief introduction to who I am. Uh, very unique, I think, uh, to bringing my experience to the to to the forefront in Vermont. So thank you. Thanks, Ashley. So uh, you can tell just by the sheer number of items uh, and the breadth and scope of this. This is really where a lot of the regulations are are going to come from, and it's become, I mean, it's a little bit of a, of a kitchen sink. Um, and some of these. Uh, I think uh, I'll have more additional conversations with the board um, and, and the timing of, of this and, and leaving some flexibility, but uh, a lot of important items in here uh, that, that are are going to be the backbone of of the, the, the regulations going forward. Uh, but this is, you know, we've, we've got a little bit of a later date on it, but we need to start a lot of these now. Um, and you know, with, with the help of, of Tim and Ingrid, Ashley and, and Carrie, uh, we'll, um, we'll start to tackle this. The next uh, subcommittee, uh, the medicinal cannabis um, from the NACB, we have Dr. Mary Clifton. Uh, doctor, if you're still on the line, if you could give a brief introduction and then we'll discuss the slide and the subcommittee. Yeah, thank you for. Uh, I'm looking forward to working with this uh, with this very extensive and impressive Vermont team. I'm an internal medicine doctor of 25 years and work in education and also in product uh, development and formulation. And uh, and uh, I'm uh, happy to uh, contribute to this committee. I've been a uh, telemedicine doctor and have done medical cannabis cards for about five years now and uh, 25 years of internal medicine practice. So I'll be working with the NACB team to uh, think about best practices for the delivery of medical cannabis in your state and, uh, and the completion of medical cannabis cards. Thank you, doctor. Um, I had good conversations with, with Jim Ronoff, Meg, um, and looking forward to working with, with Dr. Levine. Uh, Jim Romanoff's uh, report um, and, and Meg's uh, knowledge on, on, this, uh, on this subject and background uh, are pretty extensive uh, and we're aware of that. And it, this is an opportunity not just to ensure that the medicinal patients aren't going to be marginalized with the legalization uh, but also to make improvements um, and make sure we're state of the art on the medicinal program um, for issues, you know, everything ranging from from supply uh, to um, to importance um, for for these patients. So, looking forward to working on this subcommittee and getting this right as well. And I think Danique is at the final. No, we still have product safety. Um, uh, with Kim Watson and Carrie, 
we're talking about uh, lab testing standards, potency um, is a big issue, uh, and pesticides. So this is another subcommittee uh, we'll be working with Kim and carry on. And then the final subcommittee, which I think really is the um, is the brainchild of of being more forward looking and looking at uh, the other neighboring markets. Um, the exploratory committee on some cutting edge issues, uh, not necessarily cutting edge, but but important ones for the vitality of the program going forward. Um, different license types, concentrates, you can see the list here, uh, delivery, but a lot of these items on here, um, as, as Chairman Pepper has said, will hopefully help continue to distinguish the Vermont market and make sure that um, it's able to grow and prosper in the future. And you can see who the uh, who the advisory committee members, uh, Nader, uh, David Shear, Jim Romanoff, and Meg, they're on this committee as well. So that those are the seven subcommittees. Um, I'd be remiss if, Danica, if you could just give a quick introduction, everyone. I think most people have, have met you, but um, operationally, we wouldn't be able to do, especially virtually, a lot of what we're doing um, without Danica, and, and you'll see her face. So Danica, if you could just say hello. Hi, I'm Danica Scott. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. Um, I am a communicator, and I've also worked in very highly regulated industries, including banking and financial services. So I sincerely appreciate um, being able to serve the people of Vermont and this committee while working with the NACB. Thank you so much. Thanks, Danica. So those are the subcommittees. Um, I wanted to express uh, that I share everyone's enthusiasm enthusiasm on this project and working with Vermont. I want to get to the substance of the slides first, and I'll just repeat what I said in the last public meeting about my philosophy and the importance of this, this project. Uh, and I, as I said before, in spite of what's happening happening on the federal side and, the, and what in Schumer's bill and the rest of that, which I'm skeptical of, of passage in the near term. The importance of what we're doing is because this industry, as all of you know, is, is state led. And it, for those of you that follow the, the Warren Act, uh, the States Act, that was an explicit acknowledgement of, listen, the federal government will get out of the way. And as long as you're complying with your state law, um, you'll be fine. And so it's really a 10th Amendment issue. There's obviously good analogies that we can draw from the alcohol industry and how it became legalized. But this is this is a different animal because it's it's really state led, which means um, Vermont has a vital role to play, not only with legalization going forward, but really putting Vermont on the map because those of us in the industry know what the good state legislations are, what works, what the good regulations are. You can build upon some of the mistakes uh, of, of the past. So we all know, you know the eyes of the entire uh, industry uh, are upon us here in Vermont, and we think we've got an, a, a great opportunity, especially with the, with this this team and the expertise of everyone that's that's contributed on the call today. Um, but to really make a mark uh, on, on this industry and create some good policies and regulations. So, so Tom, one additional item. Would you mind introducing Eli Harrington? He is on here um, on camera, please. Sorry, Thank Eli, you. I didn't know you were on. Eli? You can give an introduction as part of the team as well. There we go. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I appreciate it. I've been uh, I've been a big fan of the NACB since I, I first uh, started working with you folks over a year ago, um, and really impressed and, and you know happy to be able to uh, bring these worlds together. So. Um, look forward to providing, you know, feedback and uh, expertise from on the ground here in Vermont with a lot of the other folks on the advisory board who you've pointed out, um, a lot of old friends and familiar faces. So, uh, yeah, really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to work with you all. Um, and I know Vicente uh, has got a great track record. So just the amount of expertise with this group is impressive and uh, excited to get to work. So thanks for uh, letting me be a part of this and look forward to getting going. Thanks, Eli. So um, I'm not sure if the board 
uh, had any questions or advisory committee um, members had particular questions, but uh, we're, we're prepared to, to answer. Tom, uh, I was wondering if you might want to just pull up the slide on the timeline. Is that is that something that you're willing to share at this point? I know you've reviewed it with a lot of the members, but for those who didn't have the benefit of being on the calls uh, that we did yesterday, um, I think folks might want to know what they're what they're in for. Okay. They're going to get to know the NACB and VSS teams very, very well in the next uh, upcoming months. So the, the dates are on here uh, with, with our calls with the advisory um, committee members yesterday. We, we talked about the Monday, Thursday meetings um, and, and the other dates in here. I, I will tell you also that it, it, it's going to require, um, you know, our, our, our communication and, and efforts probably beyond this. Um, and we, we discussed the, um, the nuances with, with, with public meeting and the communications. And obviously the success of any, any group and any project is going to be based on how well our communication um, facilities are, are, are working. Um, so I wanted to encourage everyone that my contact information was shared yesterday. Um, you can reach out to me. I think individually it's, it's probably best or the, the other NACB members or VS strategy members that are on your particular subcommittees. But yeah, thank you. Here's, here is the, uh, here's that schedule slide again for those of you that didn't see it. So I'll hit some highlights here, which are that we have some very um, pressing reporting requirements starting with October 1st on our fee structure. It's very hard to separate out what our fee structure is going to look like without understanding some of the additional issues around um, social equity and environmental compliance. Um, and so a lot of this work has to happen simultaneously. Um, the basic structure that we've been talking to folks about is having um, two meeting, each subcommittee meeting twice a week uh, for the near future. Some, I know that that's a challenge for a lot of people. Um, we all have uh, other commitments and um, other jobs and family commitments, but um, we're going to work with you. We're hopefully going to do meetings on Mondays and Thursdays for an hour long each. We, the timing will be based upon people's availability and flexibility. Um, I have in my kind of housekeeping notes how we're going to comply with open meeting laws. Um, I guess I can go into that right now. Um, essentially, the you know executive order, um, the emergency order has been lifted, so we're operating under the traditional open meeting laws, um, one VSA 310 through 314. Um, these require 24-hour notice of uh, a meeting. Um, they require an agenda posted. Um, we'll cover uh, internally some of the administrative details around posting and, and getting agendas prepared. Um, NACB will be staffing these meetings. Um, we need a physical location for each meeting um, where members of the public can attend. Um, we've been working with um, BGS to locate various office spaces around the state um, to facilitate that. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll work with you on getting physical spaces and have a person there to um, to be there to let members of the public participate. Um, you as uh, advisory committee members can participate remotely. Um, we, uh, NACB will be in charge of taking minutes um, and we'll be posting those minutes. Um, We'll have to have public comment periods at each of these subcommittee meetings. We can you know, have that at the end and allow people to participate, members of the public. Um, and then we're gonna go one step um, above and beyond the kind of requirements of the open meeting laws. Um, we will be recording um, these uh, meetings, these subcommittee meetings and the full advisory committee meetings. Um, we just really don't have the staff to manage the kind of flow of traffic and um, you know, do the kind of 
Zooming in and out or team, Microsoft Teams in, in and out of members of the public. Um, but we will record and we will post the recordings and that'll allow members of the public to go back and watch them. And then the, um, the cannabis board is going to be meeting um, once a week, probably on Fridays, uh, to review all of the work that's been done. And those meetings um, will be live streamed. People can participate remotely. Members of the public can participate remotely. That's not an additional meeting for the advisory committee. That's just a, purely a board meeting to kind of consolidate and review all of the work from the week um, for, the, for the benefit of the public, for the benefit of uh, the three of us. So that's the plan um, for open meeting laws. Are there any questions or concerns around those, either from people here or anyone, um, any of the advisory committee? Well, are there any other questions or um, concerns you'd like to raise with our consultants, either NACB or VS Strategies? No? Well, I, I'm happy to cut you all loose then. I know you probably have uh, things that you need to do. Um, thank you for that incredible introduction. Thanks for the work you've already done and thanks for partnering with Vermont as we kind of move forward in this uh, exciting new world that we're in. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna keep moving down the agenda keep things flowing. Um, we have a general housekeeping update. Um, you know, we just covered a lot of information. Um, there's some very aggressive timelines. I know it can feel a bit daunting. Um, we are here as a board and our consultants to help you. Um, you know, NACB and VS, I think, you know, are the two most prolific cannabis consulting firms in the country. Um, and they really know and have a proven track record of understanding the industry, developing policies, um, helping us uh, get the information we need. They are there as a resource for you. If you need to talk to people from other states, other regulators, if you want to see um, if there's you know, evidence or, uh, or just studies that you need or any data, please you know, talk to Bryn, talk to VS, um, talk to uh, NACB. They're there to support you. We have um, a very nimble team at the Cannabis Board. We're gonna try our best to kind of sit in on your subcommittee hearings um, individually. And, um, you know, we're not there to kind of look over your shoulders. We're really there to help you if you need our help. Um, and um, yeah, we're, I, you know, it's gonna be, we're kind of making this up as we go. Um, I, the analogy is always, you know, we're building the fire truck on the way to the fire um, or building the parachute as we're in free fall. Um, and it kind of feels like that sometimes, but I think that, you know, we'll get through this together. Um, just wanted to have a quick word on media requests. Um, we will, we do anticipate that there is going to be media interest in the work that you all are doing. Um, and you're going to get requests either for comments or interviews. Um, and um, we really, as a board, don't want to be overly prescriptive in how you deal with these. Um, but we would like you to notify us beforehand, um, just so we can have an opportunity to discuss, you know, what, what you're what you're feeling, what you want to say. And um, you know, again, we're not trying to be overly prescriptive, but we think that um, it's a good idea that we all kind of know that we're speaking with one voice to the extent that we can. Um, and are there any questions or concerns on that, either from us or on the screen? Okay. Um, so we also expect there to be a number of Public Record Act requests that come in. Um, you know, for the state, for the folks that are uh, familiar with the state, uh, you know, you're probably used to the Public Records Act request. Um, there's a lot of nuance to the public record statutes and the subsequent case law. Um, we did send a link to a presentation that the Attorney General's Office uh, provided to us um, on the Public Records Act and um, some of the uh, nuances there. The key takeaway is that almost everything that you do related to your work on the advisory committee, not your personal lives, but on the advisory committee, um, including your emails and the notes that you're taking right now, are um, considered public records and can be requested. Um, some 
will be considered transitory and you can just throw them away um, at the if you want to um, but uh, others you need to keep and um, we can go into a little bit more nuance on that but really I think the best thing for you to do if you do receive a public Rec records act request um, there are very strict deadlines and there are um, some kind of penalties built in if you're not compliant with them um, is to send them to us uh, just whenever you get one um, as soon as you get it, just send it to Bryn um, and we'll figure out how to deal with it. We'll work with you about what records are responsive, which ones might be exempt from inspection, and um, we'll just make sure that we're complying with all the deadlines there. Um, so any, any questions about that without getting too detailed into what is a public record and what is not? Yes. There is a there is so just so everybody knows there is a function on our website that allows a member of the public to make a formal public records request and if those do come in depending on what they're requesting we might the opposite of what Chairman Pepper just said be making requests of you to kind of gather certain information that, that might be relevant to a certain request. Any questions from anyone who joined by the link from the advisory committee on that? Nope. Okay. So just, I wanted to talk quickly about ethics. Um, Larry Novin, who's the executive director of the State Ethics Commission, is going to be talking to us um, later today, doing a deeper dive on some of the considerations around conflicts. I mean, you all, I mean, the state folks, again, they're probably not having, an, they probably don't have an interest in a cannabis business, but, or a license, but for some of the private folks, if you, if you have that, I think Larry's going to go through kind of how to disclose those um, and how to mitigate them. Um, but we do, uh, just for you know, something that he might not cover, is we do expect you to be asked to attend public events and do public engagement um, to discuss your work on the advisory committee. Um, it's already happened a few times, and we expect it to kind of accelerate as more focus comes in onto what we're doing. Um, we don't have any concerns about you guys participating in this. Um, I would note that if there is a quorum of you participating at a meeting talking about the business of the board, that that would be considered a public meeting and we would need to, you know, um, do all the other steps that we talked about to comply with the open meeting laws. Um, so just be very cognizant of how many of you, um, and a quorum, by the way, is a simple majority. So there's 14 advisory committee members. So what is that? Eight. Eight, seven or eight? Eight. Eight. Yeah. <laughs> so if there's eight of you in one place at one time and you're talking about the business of the board, just be very mindful of that. Um, uh, we'd ask also that if the event is specifically being built around your participation, if you're on the flyer, if someone's inviting you in your capacity as an advisory committee member, um, that you not accept any sort of gifts or honorariums for participating. Um, that includes free meals. Um, we've been advised against kind of participating in events to provide free meals, whereas other events might not, and you might feel like you're, you know, it could lead to kind of just a feeling that you're not accessible uh, or you're picking favorites. Um, and um, we also ask that the event that you attend be free of charge, no um, cost of admission and open to the public and again these are for events that are built around your participation not just an event that you might happen to be attending um, so let me know uh, if you have any questions about that can't you accept up to 25 dollars i thought in most i think you know in the code of ethics <clears throat> um it's not in the code of ethics but the ethics commission but i mean in I, the governance yeah, I just know with other states, they okay. accepted up to $25. Okay. I don't know what Vermont has. Larry Novins might know the answer to that at our ethics training. So that would, if that was the price of the meal. Yeah. Then, yeah. I, I do remember, I think the legislators have that as, as yeah. but I, I can't quite remember where the $25 figure came from. Some states specify an amount and some just say no gifts. Yeah. So yeah. it's 25 away. So those are really um, my housekeeping um, concerns or things that I wanted to raise. I'd like to talk briefly about what the board has been up to um, since we started um, and just give you a progress report. Um, so the board uh, was 
seated in mid-April. April 19th was our first day. Um, for those of you who are, you know, keeping track on Act 164, um, that's about four and a half or five months later than we were contemplated being set. Um, and these, that delay, which really was a result of the pandemic, um, you know, the bill, which was supposed to take effect in July, didn't take, take effect until October, and then every subsequent kind of milestone along the way was pushed back. Um, but um, that had the result of us missing our original reporting requirements, um, which was our fee structure. That date got moved to October 1st um, uh, in a bill that passed this year. But um, of course, any fee structure needs to be approved by the full General Assembly. And so um, we're not going to have any sort of approval on our fee structure until January at the earliest. Um, however, we do expect that um, the relevant committees, the two, the two um, finance committees and the um, GovOps committees, will take up our fee structure in the off session and give some sort of tacit approval to it or tell us to kind of come back with something new. Um, so we do feel that we can kind of tee up that fee structure for a very early uh, movement in January. Um, so in the meantime, um, we are going to, um, as you know, start drafting regulations based upon your recommendations to us. Um, and um, we're going to kind of have our rules and regulations drafted and hopefully ready to go for as soon as we can, you know, have some understanding of whether our fee structure will be approved. Um, so that's the kind of the vision for the next couple months. You've seen the kind of timelines for getting those recommendations to us and, and kind of the full board approval. Um, so I just wanted to tell you quickly about what we as a board have been up to in the meantime. Um, so in addition to kind of getting the nuts and bolts of a staff in place and creating this new state agency, um, we did a early deep dive into the two pieces of legislation um, that created the board and gave us our directives. Those are Act 164 of 2020 and Act 62 of 2021. Um, and so we, at a very early meeting, we sat down with the legislative council that drafted those pieces of legislation and um, some of the lead sponsors of those, of those bills to really distill what they and we believe are the core principles that underline this policy shift. Um, so um, we held weekly meetings after that um, dedicated to those specific priorities. And um, we heard from you know, Vermont and um, national other state agencies about their experience. Um, we heard from local organizations, national and international experts, um, and interested stakeholders around the state um, to flesh out how we can effectively achieve the priorities that are in Act 164 and 62. So last week, um, we wrapped up those meetings. We had our final one, and we um, compiled all of the information that we had. We compared notes with one another. Um, you know, we're subject to the same open meeting laws, and so you know, there's three of us. So anytime the two of us are together talking about the business of the board, it has to be in the context of an open meeting. So we actually don't really get a chance to talk to each other about cannabis policy all that much, except, you know, on our weekly meetings. Um, so we created a mission statement for the board, and um, I'd like to pull it up. I know Nelly was uh, was going to pull it up for us. She had a copy of it, Dave. I don't know if you can do that, Brent. Let's find out. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think it's important. It's really kind of a North Star kind of document for us. It's the seven priorities that we believe are the way to achieve our mission, which as stated by the legislature, is to effectively, safely, and equitably um, create rules for adult use cannabis and medical use. So we kind of think that these are the ways that we can do it. Okay. I have it here. <laughs> How do I get it there? Um, Thank you. Yep. 
Okay. And um, we, of course, in coming up with these in the kind of supporting paragraphs, um, have a lot of data and um, testimony to back up each one, but we tried our best to um, kind of consolidate it. So while we try and get this up, um, this we consider this to be somewhat of a living document. Uh, we're not uh, we're not tied to the language that's in there currently. If if there are um, recommendations from this group, um, and we've reached out to some um, other interested stakeholders uh, about how to modify the language, um, we'd be open to those suggestions. I don't know, it's showing up on, uh, I think everybody else can see it but us, because I have it right here. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to read them to the people that are in the room if you want to pull it up in the, on the screen um, one, one more time. Okay. Sorry, so we can't see it in the room, but I'm going to just read them to you. Um, so the first priority um, is around the legacy market, which um, for those aren't familiar with that terminology, it really is the, um, the current Vermont cultivators, the people that are growing currently. And so the legacy market and small cultivators. And so the board kind of has met with a number of small cultivators and talked about the barriers to entry for them. You know, one of the key priorities is to shift a lot of the legacy market in, into the regulated market to kind of try to um, you know, have a regulated space that's welcoming for small cultivators. And so we said, the board seeks to encourage small cultivators and entrepreneurs in the legacy market to enter the regulated market by reducing barriers to entry and facilitating innovation. The next priority is around social equity. Um, so the board acknowledges the disproportionate impact of the government-led policies created in the war on drugs particularly those that impacted BIPOC in economically and educationally disadvantaged communities. The board aspires to play a part in mitigating the harm created by the prohibition of cannabis by building a program that is equitable and accessible. To this end, the board will prioritize inclusivity in its process of building the program and endeavor to collect data on the program to inform course correction. So the next priority is around energy, environment, and land use. Vermont can be a trailblazer in the national market by establishing a program that prioritizes environmental stewardship as a foundational principle. As a result, the board has a fundamental responsibility to encourage and facilitate outdoor and mixed light growing over a controlled environment indoor cultivation. The board will endeavor to educate stakeholders on the goals and intent of the regulatory framework and support industry participants to achieve these goals. Uh, the next is around youth prevention and education. The board acknowledges the effects of cannabis use on the cognitive and socio-emotional development of youth and young adults. To this end, the board will endeavor to develop a program that focuses on the prevention of cannabis use among youth and educates consumers on the risks involved in cannabis consumption. Um, the fifth is on consumer protection. Uh, it's imperative that, the, that Vermont cannabis users have the option to purchase cannabis and cannabis-derived products that are tested, labeled, and free from harmful contaminants. To achieve this goal, the board will rely on the expertise of the Agency of Agriculture to ensure that consumer protection standards are achieved in both the adult use and medical use programs in Vermont. Uh, the sixth is around medical program services. The board will ensure that patients maintain a continuity of access to the existing medical programs, program services and will endeavor to reduce the regulatory burden impacting patients and caregivers, ensure that medical cannabis meets quality standards and facilitate the development 
of educational programs for healthcare professionals. And then the last one is on public safety. And I would just say this one seems a little short um, compared to the others, but it's really because the public safety elements have not been delegated to our jurisdiction. You know, there are certain consumer protection and advertising and youth prevention, but as far as safe, I think safe banking is really in and keeping an eye on highway safety are really the two areas that the board needs to be focused on. But so for public safety, legalizing cannabis and cannabis sales can be a harm reduction policy if done responsibly. So those are our guiding principles. Um, and again, as I mentioned, we would see, we would welcome input to this, um, both from members of the public, interested stakeholders, and the advisory committee. But those are the things that both the legislature and we identified as the kind of key priorities that we need to focus on while we develop regulation. And we'll send that around so that everyone has that. Um, and um, that's kind of uh, what we've been up to for the last, I guess, since April. Um, and uh, we do have all of our meetings recorded and posted on our website if anyone wants to go back and look at who we've been talking to and what sort of information we've received as the board. So um, that is all I have for um, um, for our kind of general housekeeping. I'd like to just insert uh, a quick public comment period for members of the public that have joined. Um, if you would like to provide the board public comment, um, we ask that you raise your virtual hand uh, if you join through the link. And um, I guess we'll start with David Silverman. Uh, thank you, Chair Pepper. Um, I, I was I have more of a question than a comment, uh, which is, is there any update um, on whether subcommittee hearings will be accessible via uh, live stream? I, I, just following up on the various comments you got at the last meeting about that. Uh, yes. So um, the update is, is we will have the capacity um, uh, NACB has volunteered to record the meetings um, and post them to uh, our website, um, but we just really do not have the capabilities to kind of manage the flow of um, people coming in and out virtually. So we will record them and post them, but we won't have um, kind of remote participation at the, at the meeting itself. We will have, of course, a physical location for um, for members of the public to join uh, physically. And if there is a change to the uh, emergency order on the state of emergency, we will comply with the open meeting law changes that come along with that. So I see Amelia has her hand raised. Yeah, um, just to respond to the uh, the medical priorities that you guys just laid out. Um, I, I do think that what you have there is really great. I would like to also see, along with accessibility, affordability included there, because I do believe that affordability starts with instruction and guidance from the regulatory body. Um, and that's all I had to say. Thanks, Amelia. Anyone else uh, who joined by the link, if you could raise your virtual hand. Jesse Lynn. Hi, thanks so much for, for uh, having me and for everything you guys are doing and all the advisory board members and all the work you're putting forward. But I did just want to quickly mention one thing if I could. As a you know female identifying person in the cannabis industry here in the state of Vermont, I just want to mention and ask that you guys please consider using more inclusive language when speaking of women and mothers. So language, you know, such as female identifying persons and parents isn't as exclusive comparatively. And I just feel it's crucial to mention some of this more supportive language, especially within the advisory board and the advisory board folks um, representing feminine cam cannabis community here in Vermont. So if we could just, you know, please consider changing and using different language, I would be much appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica. Anyone else uh, would like to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hand. 
And if anyone's joined by the, oh, Jeffrey, feel free. Good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me and see me? Yes. Excellent. Um, for the record, my name is Jeffrey Piccolo. Uh, I'm the executive director and co-founder of the Vermont Growers Association. That is the trade association for the cannabis professionals in our state. Thank the Vermont Brewers Association. Um, I thank everybody uh, for uh, introducing themselves, members of the AC uh, board, uh, to meeting all of you. Um, we are also members of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition uh, with other esteemed nonprofits across the state. Um, and we just wanted to make a point to, um, well, first of all, thank NACB uh, for reaching out to us. Uh, we've had a couple meetings with them so far. Uh, and we look forward to meeting with them privately as they work with everyone around that table and virtually to arrive at equitable and fair legislation for our state. Um, we have not heard from VSS uh, and we have not heard from Eli Harrington, who we uh, are understanding as a subcontractor of NACB. Uh, it would be great uh, to meet with those entities as well. So I'll put out a public invite uh, to those organizations. Um, and uh, I just want to say that um, there are uh, some concerns that uh, our coalition has with some of the appointees. Um, there are members on the advisory committee that hold active professional affiliations and associations with multi-state operators. Uh, some of them are large business actors that operate in our state. And so uh, we understand that this is a small state and people need to do what they do from a business perspective, but we also understand that from the optics alone, uh, that that can be a disqualifier uh, for some of these uh, appointments. And so we wanted to uh, stress that. We do have some concerns about some of the appointees on the AC uh, and um, we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, Jeffrey. Anyone else? Uh, Jesse Lynn, is your hand back up? There it is. Oh, I think I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Thank you. Um, just also wanted to throw out there as we talk about having representation for patients, and I appreciate Jim Romanoff being there to be that that beacon, um, just mentioning to f that we could use and benefit from finding a way to make sure we're including and hearing from all patient voices. Um, Jim is a fantastic guy using the dispensary system very successfully, so I'm grateful for that for him. But um, just to mention and to put on record as we're you know in this meeting that um, there are a subset of both cultivators, caregivers, and patients who can't afford the dispensary system that don't feel that they have a voice of representation. And if the Symptom Relief Oversight Committee, I believe, is hopefully working towards that to be able to have larger perspective of other Vermont voices as well. So thank you. Thank you, Jesse Lynn. Any other public comments? Um, okay, well, uh, we're going to take a break uh, right now. Um, we are going to just kind of keep things moving. Um, you know, we've got some lunch that's on its way here, um, and then we're going to start uh, up again at 1230. Um, so I'll take a break for now, and um, we'll be back at 1230. Great. Okay, um, we're back. It's uh, 12.30. Um, this is the Vermont Cannabis Board Advisory Committee inaugural meeting. And um, next on our agenda is to hear from Susanna Davis about equity in the cannabis business. And, um, you know, she's an informal advisory committee member. She's been, by statute, um, given the honor of helping us <laughs> uh, um, develop our social equity programming, our definition of social equity applicant, and making sure that we're considering equity in every decision we make. Not
So I know we have an hour. I know that's not enough time. Um, Susanna, this is her second time with the board and hopefully the second of many. And um, I'll hand things off to you. All right, excellent. So I'm going to do a screen share. And also, for those in the room, I'm going to stand. Um, I wasn't going to tell you this, but the reason I was excited to come here in person is because I get to use the clicker again. <laughs> <laughs> but if I'm in front of a computer, I can't really. So I'm going to be back here. So I can. This is it. Um, okay, so hi, everybody. I'm Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. Very pleased to be here with you again today. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit more about equity. So first, we'll recap a little bit of what we heard in the last meeting, which was May 27th, the last time I joined the group. Um, and then today, we're going to focus specifically on the state equity impact assessment tool, and also a little bit about communication and messaging. There's a lot more to say about communication and messaging. Um, we're not going to cover it all today. I'll probably send you all more materials afterwards, but this is a primer within a primer to a primer. So, let's started. Okay, so last time we talked about the difference between equality and equity, right? Uh, the image you're looking at shows bike, the bicycle parade, right? On the top, everyone's got the same bicycle. They're receiving the same treatment, and that's not working out well for the very tall person, the very small person, and the person who uses a wheelchair. Reflected on the bottom is equity, where everyone is afforded the resources and tools necessary for them to be able to enjoy this figurative bike parade we call life in a way that is most meaningful to them, right? So we talked a little bit about the ways in which equity and equality are different. We also talked about this big monstrosity, which is um, some of the very many ways in which equity presents itself in our society. Things like felon disenfranchisement, voter suppression, uh, discipline measures in education, segregation and zoning, and the ways in which that creates high-performing school districts and not so high-performing school districts. We talked about Vermont's history with things like eugenics and the impact that has on today's indigenous community in the state. We talked about Tuskegee, substance use, the opioid crisis compared to the crack epidemic of the 80s. Uh, we talked about redlining, neighborhood amenities, right? Who gets investments? Who gets disinvestments, right? So those are some of the things we covered last time. Today, I want to talk a little bit about messaging and communication. And the reason I want to talk about that is because so much of the discourse around cannabis has to do with antiquated views of who are its users, who are its producers and purveyors, and what does it mean to be a member of the cannabis community, if that's a thing, right? So. Part of that lore, part of those stereotypes are really deeply rooted in messaging to which we have all been exposed for many, many years. Some of us our entire lifetime, right? This goes back decades. Um, I could get into the history of how the term marijuana comes from an indigenous word from Mexico and was hyped up by American policymakers as a way to further distance Americans from it because it was racialized, because we use a non-English word to describe it, which is true, but I'm not going to say it, even though I kind of sneakily just did. <laughs> so these are some of the really sneaky tactics that are used by and through policymakers to normalize or stigmatize certain social and legal ideas or things, right? So I'm going to give you some examples of coded messaging. And for those of you who've seen my presentations in the past, I have a lot because everything is coded. Everything is a lie. How was your day? It was great. That's coded message, right? <laughs> um, so I'm not going to go through all the examples that I usually do today, but we'll just touch on some of them. The images you're seeing right now are the cover and an inside panel of one of the Tintin books, right? Marketed to children, wholesome, you know? Um, but on the right, you see one panel where Tintin appears to be negotiating with an unusually dark person, uh, highly caricaturized in the sort of 
minstrel way that used to be done in media. Um, this person responds back with, yes, master. And the dog makes the insightful comment that this person does not appear to be very bright. This is what children are, are given, right? It's very blatant. It's very in your face. And if you say anything bad about it, then people will get mad and buy every copy of this book in protest. Okay. Here's another one, again, aimed at children. We're uh, looking at a page in one of those books where you trace the dotted lines so you can practice writing your letters. The images title of happy and proud are associated with light-skinned children's faceless faces. Sad and angry get dark skin because only brown people have negative feelings. Oh, sorry, I should pause because uh, I didn't intro this. Um, what I'm going to play for you now is a clip that's about one minute long. This is a uh, recording of the doll test. By a show of hands of the people in the room, who has heard of the doll test? Okay, a good number of you. For those who haven't, I'm going to give a quick explanation. Kenneth and Mamie Clark, they are husband and wife duo, and they were actual pioneers in American psychology. Oh, thank you, Kim. I see hands digitally as well. Um, pioneers in American psychology. They were the first African-American presidents of the American Psychological Association, and they devised a series of experiments through which they sat children down with a white doll and a black doll in front of them and asked the children a series of questions. Which doll is smart? Which doll is pretty? Which doll is poorly behaved? Which doll is ugly? And it showed the ways in which children have absorbed the positive and negative messaging around race and color, and the way that they reflect it back when being asked to state preferences or ideals about dolls. So what you're going to watch now is a short clip showing some of these experiments, and I hope the audio works, because you know, hybrid meetings are rough. <laughs> No, we're going to pause. Let me see if I unmute here. Okay, okay, we're getting closer. <laughs> Everybody might be able to hear it. We just got to turn off your ear. It won't come through the phone. Okay, for those who are on the phone or in the call, I would so appreciate if you could just give us some kind of reaction to let us know whether you did just hear that little audio clip. Okay, thank you. So I will turn up my volume for those of you in the room, because for once you all are the ones at a disadvantage. Okay. All right. All right. Oh, here, I'm going to back myself. Do you remember? If, did I have it on or off? You had it on. I think once we get this rolling, we'll be able to just hear it. There's no audio for those of us on the call. Okay. Okay. Stop mute yourself. You have to mute this. 
computer. All right. So we're just going to pretend that never happened. For those of you on the call, I'm sorry for not uh, being able to get the text correct for you, but I will fill you in on the audio that you did not hear. So um, the children were asked questions like, which doll is pretty, which doll is ugly, which doll is bad, which doll is good? At one point, a child is asked, why is this doll pretty when he pointed at the white baby? And his answer was, because she's white and has blue eyes. So the purpose of this video, and this has been reproduced and replicated numerous times. If you've got 10 minutes, I strongly encourage you later on just to do a web search for doll experiments. This has been done in different countries, different languages, children of different age groups. I think Anderson Cooper did one at one point. I mean, it's, it's been replicated so many times and the tragic result is the same. Children have internalized negative attitudes about skin and hair and size and everything else you can imagine. These are things that are fed to us from very early ages, not just in the US, but around the world. And for that reason, we end up later in life using those same biases to inform our actions, both socially and through policymaking, which leads us to things like this. No, not to the sketch. <laughs> <laughs> which leads us to things like this. The idea that black boys as young as 10 are more likely to be mistaken as older, right? Think of Tamir Rice, the 12 year old who was described by police before they murdered him as looking like a big man. They're more likely to be perceived as guilty and to face police violence if they're accused of crime. They're also more often viewed as being responsible for their actions at younger ages when white boys still benefit from the assumption that children are essentially innocent. We see this all the time, right? Adult man boys who get described as, he's just a kid. It's just boys will be boys, right? But young teenagers, who have the audacity to exist in a world with Skittles are murdered because they look like, quote, thugs. So these are the ways in which the coded messages that we receive throughout our lives shape the ways we interact with the world. Now, I've talked a lot about negative examples of messaging, right? These are the things I really want you not to do. But let's talk about a couple of the ways in which we can do this correctly. So as a lot of you know, in my last job, I worked for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And one of the things that you, you know about the first city, um, and for that reason, we have a lot of people with a lot of cultures, and we've got to find and feed information to all of them. So the city health department used to do messaging around nutrition, and they would use images like what you see before you. Campaign billboards, subway ads, advertisements on the sides of buses that show a so-called healthy plate, right? And it's fine, you know, it works, whatever, who doesn't like broccoli? But it wasn't quite reaching certain target audiences, particularly Asian New Yorkers. So the city partnered up with a local health giant, NYU, and did a little revamping of the healthy plates, which was great, because, I mean, look at the oranges, right? I'm going to go back to the first one. Who really eats oranges like that? <laughs> you can do it. It's a thing, but why? <laughs> so they revamped the plate a little bit, made it a little bit more modern, but they didn't just stop there. Here's another version of the same plate. This is the Korean version. Notice it's written in Korean. The oranges look normal now. And if you look at the items that are on the plate, they're much more culturally responsive. They're representative of the foods that you might encounter in that community. You've got the soup, you've even got the correct utensil layout, mm -hmm. right? This is something that demonstrates that time has been put into this campaign so that we could reach everyone with the basic message. You may not be eating foods that more Americans who are white eat, and that's fine. But whatever you're eating, let's balance your macros this way, right? So these are ways in which you can use marketing in a way that is effective, culturally responsive, and respectful, and it's easy to do. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how messaging has gone wrong in an area that you all are working on right now. 
You'll see on the left a headline that talks about so-called marijuana moms who have come together, they're largely you know, white women in America, who have come out and been brave enough to say that pot makes us better parents and we should end the stigma. And I heard it so succinctly put by some you know, user on, I don't know, Twitter or whatever. Um, and I think I should just quote that person who in response to this said, yeah, well, we'd probably make black men better fathers too, but we'll never know because they're stuck in jail for it. On the right, you see another headline from Ford. Cannabis takes the world stage at the Tokyo Olympics with a little bit of a blurb below about Megan Rapinoe and her involvement and the inclusion of cannabis products in her and other elite athletes training routines. Hey, can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Because for a second, I couldn't hear myself over the deafening absence of Shikari Richardson from the Olympics for her cannabis use. So, as we think about who gets rewarded and profiled and quoted and called brave and who does not, these are some of the long-term messaging um, practices that have been put upon us that have created an environment in which we have allowed certain members of society to feel comfortable admitting to something that is still technically list, you know, um, scheduled right, at the federal level and other people to have had their lives ruined and families broken because of it. Here's another example of selective messaging. And these are going to be examples of exculpatory language. LAPD tweets that when officers arrived in the area, they saw a male matching the description armed with a handgun. At that time, there was an officer involved shooting. The man was struck by gunfire and transported to a local hospital where he had died. That's a lot of words to say, we killed a guy. It's written in an incredibly exculpatory manner. It's very passive language and look, I've worked in government for some years now. That's how government talks. And that's why government has been hurting communities for so many years, because that's still how we talk. Here's another example. There was another so-called officer involved shooting and the NYPD commissioner states, he was an NYPD officer that discharged his firearm. As a result of that discharge, an individual was struck in the head and killed. Did I get struck or did you shoot me? Here's the last one. Really just wow, this one. Um, there was a raid where DEA and local police, uh, broke, they, they burst into this home. Turns out they had the wrong family, but they didn't know it at the time. So they took a 13-year-old girl in the house. They pulled her out of her bed at gunpoint. The dogs were, she had an asthma attack and also vomited, and then she passed out from fear. The dogs were barking and they said, if you don't silence your dogs, we're going to shoot them. All of this stuff. They had the wrong family. And then in their press release afterwards, they said, quote, we sincerely regret that while attempting to execute an arrest warrant for a member of this drug trafficking organization, the innocent McKay family was inadvertently affected by this enforcement operation. Inadvertently affected. You scared a child into an asthma attack and you call that inadvertently affected. So, what does this have to do with cannabis? When we talk about creating policy, when we talk about amending statutes, hearing from people with lived experience, defining what is a social equity applicant, everything that this body will produce is going to have words on it. It may even have pictures. We all love a good picture book, right? The words and the images and the colloquialisms and the mannerisms and everything that we do and use to communicate to the public, it communicates not just our intentions, as great as they may be, but it also communicates every bit of unconscious information we've ever received throughout our lives. And if those bits of information, audio, visual, or otherwise, are still laced with the coded messaging around culpability and age and color and 
drug use and what is even considered a drug, right? If we're still producing a work product that is laced with those things, we will continue to produce work products that further those biases and stereotypes. Right? Skip one, yes. So let's get practical. And I forgot, I actually, that was, that was the little section. So I need to hurry up. Um, so I've said this before to you, you know this already, structural problems require structural solutions, not individual solutions, right? So if we know that we have an issue that is broad, maybe poverty or maybe uh, drug enforcement or I don't know, the electrical system in the building, right? That is a structural thing. If the system fails us and our building goes dark, it would be improper to say to everybody, hey guys, new rule, from now on walk around with your cell phones as a flashlight because the lights are out and you've just got to go for stuff. That would be an individual solution to a systemic problem. The systemic solution is let's fix the lights, let's pay the bill or whatever it takes to get the lights back on, right? So we have a structural problem, we need a structural solution for it. Now we know that when we apply an equity lens to our work, yes, we're looking at things like fiscal impact, operational impact, economic impact, which I guess is fiscal impact. I was looking for a third example. But we're also needing to look at the equity impact. That is the only way that you can make stable policy that is going to benefit everybody. So let's talk a little bit about intent versus impact. So usually, policy gets made based on the needs and the preferences of people in power, people in dominant groups, right? Our rules are our rules because they've been made for and by people who have either power or clout or whose opinions we care about, right? This usually creates disparate impacts for historically marginalized groups. I will give an example. There's some building somewhere, I don't know the details, leave me alone, but it's like some tech startup and they thought it would be cool in their modern building to have certain sections of the floor in the hallways just be glass pane, like see-through floors, right? Oh, hey, cool, there's Brian on the seventh floor, right? Oh, look, there's Mackenzie up there, right? If there's a Brian or a Mackenzie here, I'm not singling you out, I made these up. Um, that design tells me nobody who wears a skirt or kilt was in the room when you decided to do that. I'm not walking on a floor that's see-through under those circumstances. So, who's in the room? Who's at the table? If you don't have the right voices present, you will create disparate impacts for historically marginalized groups. So, if you build a brand new building and your doors are not 30, 36s, I can't fit my wheelchair through there. It's 2021, we don't need to keep making that mistake at this point, right? So, we do have sometimes well-meaning policies and they are really intended to be neutral, but they end up having a disparate impact anyway. We don't always intend for that. Sometimes it happens, right? So it's not the intent, it's the impact. Now in 2013, the federal government added a new level of analysis to its policy making and it said, we're not just gonna look at what we intended to do, we're gonna look at the impact too. Because sometimes, as, as try as you might, you still end up creating things that may have disparate impact. In 2020, that same federal government said, you know what, we don't care about that. As long as we can plausibly argue that we didn't intend to create a disparity, we're just going to remove that standard so we don't really have to do anything about it. Now, that means that a rule theoretically could proceed even if it did cause a disparity. Now, that rule change was never made, but it is, first of all, scary that it was ever proposed by the federal government in the first place. Now, what that means is that in order to avoid creating disparity, whether intentionally or unintentionally, one of the things that we should be using is an equity impact assessment tool. This is something that I mentioned at the last meeting, so this may seem a little familiar to some of you. Um, and this is a tool that we use in the executive agencies that is supposed to be accompanying every budget and policy proposal that comes out of the admin. An equity impact assessment is a systemic examination of how different marginalized groups might be affected by a proposed action or a decision. We use it mainly to minimize unanticipated negative consequences. It, I mean, it, it, it maximizes the investment because we're able to say, hey, you know what, if we really want to reach the people who need it most, maybe we should do it in these three regions instead of this region that always gets um, funding and support. 
Or, hey, you know what? We've omitted something really important that actually puts us out of compliance with federal law. Let's not get sued and let's fix that, right? So if you conduct an equity impact assessment during your decision-making phase, when you're still forming your process and your policies, that is the best time to be using it. And what I'm going to do right now is very quickly walk, don't laugh, I mean quickly, for real, uh, walk you through what the sections look like. If I have, I think I've shared So um, this is something that I have shared with this group. I hope that you all will consider using it in your work. It is something, like I said, that's already mandated by the executive agencies. Governor's office has confirmed to everybody that uh, they will not green light a budget or policy proposal that comes out of the admin if it does not have this attached to it. And it's something that we're also um, looking to assist with the legislature to create as well, one for them. So really quickly, uh, the sections of this are the background and intent, stakeholders, multi-sectoral collaboration, benefits and burdens, and data collection. So this is what you see at the top. It's a nice blurb about how we like equity, and it instructs people to um, complete this form and submit it. We've got certain questions that are required for a first round of analysis, but eventually this entire form is required for a final green line. You don't need to know that, but it's just there on the screen. So the first portion is the proposal background. It asks the respondent to describe the proposal, what pr uh, problem is this intended to solve, what are the intended outcomes, is it evidence-based, et cetera. The next session is strategic plan, metrics, goals, and ind indicators. As you all know, there is a statewide strategic plan. We take it very seriously. And so this section asks respondents to state clearly how their proposal fits in line with the strategic plan with its metrics, goals, and indicators. The next section looks at interagency or multi-sectoral collaboration. So it's asking, what other agencies are you involving? Are you prioritizing um, MWBEs, for example, that's minority and women-owned business enterprises? Are you encouraging investment and collaboration with people from other sectors? This is really important because in Vermont, oftentimes policy, well, in all, in all states, Oftentimes, policy is made in a very top-down way, but by being able to bring in people, ignore the org chart, and just say, who needs to hear this and do this and see this? Bring them in, right? Next section, stakeholders and impacted populations. So the respondent is being asked to describe the target population, which includes demographic information, geographic areas that are going to be most impacted, whether public written materials are going to be generated, and if so, which into which languages will they be translated, et cetera. Next section, benefits and burdens, um, describing whether there are anticipated disparities for any groups and how you can mitigate those disparities. Is there going to be a funding cut? If so, who's that going to harm? Is there going to be a funding boost? If so, is it going to boost in the areas and the, the demographics who need it most? Then there's a glossary, which, you know, defines just a few very basic terms. Now, I want to talk to you about two use cases for this tool, because it is a lot of work. I breeze through these questions, but they're going to require that somebody really, or multiple somebody, sit down and spend all the time answering them. And that can be burdensome. I get that. And you know what's more burdensome? Systemic racism. But anyway, here's one use case for this tool. This is one case in which we did not do an equity impact assessment, and it did create a racial disparity. A few years ago, the state of Vermont took past Tobacco 21, which, uh, among other things, prohibited possession of tobacco by any person under 21. Now, the thing about that is that there was no religious carve-out in that bill. And as a result, indigenous people, Abenaki Vermonters under 21, and that community views tobacco as a sacred plant, it's used in rituals like spiritual, like purification and um, sorry, conveyance of prayers. Uh, so with no religious carve out, it means that young indigenous people in Vermont cannot even possess something considered sacred to their culture that grows out of the dirt because it is illegal, because we did not do an equity impact assessment that would have surfaced for us this disparity. Now, if they had, use this tool, which admittedly didn't exist at the time. But this tool as it exists now, here are the questions that would have surfaced that disparity. 
How will the proposal incorporate cultural concerns of a specific group, including use of traditional healing practices, et cetera? Did you meaningfully consult with community members in developing the proposal? Did those community members include persons of color? Could a disparate racial impact or other unintended consequence result from this? What steps are you taking to mitigate? Is there a disparate impact for any other marginalized group, including but not limited to national origin, religion, orientation, gender identity, et cetera? Those are the questions that likely would have surfaced that important issue that our indigenous people are still waiting for us to correct. Here's a second use case. This is a situation in which we sort of did do an equity impact assessment and were able to mitigate uh, racial disparity. So we didn't do the formal, formal assessment, but we followed the spirit of the EIA uh, when we were allocating recovery money post COVID. Oh, well, I guess it's not really post COVID, but um, so there were some business grants that were issued, a lot of recovery money and downtowns and small biz and all of that. And one of the things that we did was have an intentional set aside of $5 million for minority owned and women owned business enterprises. We know that oftentimes businesses led by women identified people and by people of color are often last to know about opportunities, particularly in Vermont where everything is a very closed network. And if you're not plugged into that early information, you're basically last in line. We know that a lot of times these materials are promulgated in English exclusively and so if I'm a business owner who's limited English proficient, by the time I found out about it, it's probably the day before the deadline. We also know that generally speaking, um, I think earlier on during the recovery efforts, up to about 85% of business owners of color in America were unable to access or utilize PPP funds. So even when something is alleged to be accessible to us, it often in practice is not. So being able to have this set aside, this carve out, allowed us to ensure that there was a dedicated pool of money that wasn't going to be, I don't want to use a word with a negative connotation, but that wasn't going to be dipped into before underrepresented business owners had the opportunity to participate in the program. So those are two examples where an EIA either did or could have mitigated an unintended racial disparity. Now, you may have a few questions. I am going to try to predict some of those questions and answer them here. First one, okay, we did an analysis and oops, we ended up having a disparity in our proposal after all. Well, what do you do? The wrong answer is let's just do it anyway. Because we like the idea and we spent a lot of time working on it and I made a really nice glossy brochure and I don't want to change it. And there's only two black people anyway, so does it really matter? That's the wrong answer, right? The correct answer is go back to square zero, workshop it, and do it again. Second one, um, well, we sort of already, oh, well, that's actually not for you. This has to do with state agencies that already do an equity analysis, so don't worry about that. Stereotyping, somebody asked us, isn't this kind of stereotyping? Well, no, right? If I'm building a brand new building, I don't know who's going to live or work there, but I know that if anybody who is going to live or work there uses a wheelchair, I need to make my doors the minimum width that can support that. It's not stereotyping, it's quite the opposite actually. It's ensuring inclusion by reducing the barriers that have served to exclude people. I'm gonna give a short anecdote here. When I was in New York at the health department, we were partnering with our housing and buildings agency to do a series of community conversations about infrastructure and zoning and all of that. And uh, we were doing some of those in different offices around the city. And my colleague at Department of Buildings, he, uh, she called me and she said, hey, can we do the next one in your building at the health department in Long Island City, Queens? because we need a building that's accessible. We're gonna have some community residents joining and they use motorized wheelchairs. And I said, yeah, oh my gosh, yes, our building is great. It's LEED certified, green, whatever. We've got wide doorways, everything's fine. It'll be great, we can. And as I was saying that, I was looking out my window and I had to stop myself and say, you know what? Actually, no, I'm sorry, we can't. Because in that moment, I had seen the seven train roll in. And I remember that even though our building was accessible, the local train stop was not. And in a city like New York, that matters because people don't drive. Um, 
So the moral of the story was you can do everything in your power to make your little corner of the world inclusive, but if the broader structures upon which you rely are not inclusive, they will undermine and thwart your efforts, which is why we call this systemic. My building can be LEED certified for green excellence and all that stuff, but if the train stop you operate that's 100 years old is still not accessible, then who cares if I'm having a dinner party, right? So, next, what if we don't have data that speak to this, that are on point? Some of the questions ask them for any data that they've relied on to ensure that this policy is going to be equitable. Well, what if there aren't data? Yeah, you know what? In Vermont, there often aren't. And so the next thing to do is, one, we can extrapolate from some national data. Vermont is a lovely and unique place, but it's not so unique that we're that different from the rest of rural white America. We can extrapolate from some other jurisdictions, number one. And number two, another thing that we can do is make it an explicit goal and part of your initiative to collect those baseline data. If you don't have it, but you know you could have used it if it did exist, be the ones to implement it. Next, uh, do we use quantitative data alone, or can we use, or should we use qualitative data? I have been told by people in this state, <laughs> well, one, this particular person who told me that all qualitative data is bad. She said it's useless, and the only thing that matters is numbers. This person in the same breath also told me that I was forgetting about systemic racism. So I am skeptical of her assessments of things. But um, the question about whether we use qualitative and or quantitative data is a simple one. Absolutely use those qualitative data. And this group has already been doing that. You've heard from people with lived experience. You've heard from people who um, have either gone through the justice system or who are small business owners, or you've heard from agency folks about the raw numbers, et cetera. Um, and so my, my, my advice to you is to keep doing that. Because oftentimes people are fall people fall through the, the, the cracks because they are let loose in the numbers. I didn't phrase that well, but what I'm trying to say is numbers don't capture everything. Right? And even when they do, sometimes everything is a little too accurate. And what I mean by that is I, just as an example, in the building structure house where I live, I am the only Hispanic person. If I move out, that is a 100% reduction in the Hispanic population of my little thing. Now, 100% is a big number, right? And granted, I'm a big person, but still, the point is that data are helpful, absolutely. And yet, the stories behind the data, the lives behind the data, and the possibility beyond the data are of such great value to us that it's a missed opportunity. And in fact, in some cases can be dangerous for us to rely only on the quantitative and not the qualitative data. What else do I have for you? Oh yes, so I was starting to feel bad because I'm depressing you so much, which I always do. I just go into a room and make people feel uncomfortable all the time. And that can get <laughs> draining. So um, normally I, I end these with a quote and I am gonna end it with a quote but that quote is also depressing. So before that, <laughs> I am going to give you a comic strip. You're welcome. This is an example of two individuals who did not perform an equity impact assessment, and it is having a disparate impact on their friend. Now, I know a joke is less funny when you have to explain it, but for accessibility's sake, I'm going to explain it. We have two individuals who have apparently planned a party, and they thought we should invite Drew. And the blue one says, eh, he always has an excuse. So they call up Drew and invite him to the party, but Drew is a beautiful flower, and he says, I can't because I am rooted to the ground. And then they say he can't come. I told you. And so the point is, if they had done an EIA, they would have realized that their party was not accessible to anyone who can, who has no legs. <laughs> and that is the point, and that's why Drew can't go to the party. All right, so uh, I want to talk to you, I want to give you this quote from John Ehrlichman, who you might remember, 
as the Nixon advisor slash Watergate co-conspirator, who in 1994, after serving his, uh, after repaying his debt to society, he stated, quote, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black. But, and by the way, just as an aside, um, we don't use black as a noun. So black, just in case anyone was ever curious, <laughs> don't do that, please. Um, we knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. Now, there's speculation about whether he was really serious when he said this and whether he meant it because some people thought that he had a bone to pick because he was mad about the whole Watergate scandal and that he might have overstated the intent here. But you know what? I don't buy it. I think he meant it. I think that's what they did. And remember, we talked about intent versus impact. Whether they intended it wasn't the point. These are the highest some of the highest paid advisors in the country. They're supposed to be the cream of the crop. And yet, this was the impact they ended up having, even if we question whether that was really the intent. I believe it was the intent, but what do I know? I'm just a guy in Vermont. Either way, that quote and that behavior and that marble that was rolled, that started being rolled by the Nixon admin, and even before then, led to a war on drugs that grew and grew and grew, swallowed up people and families and communities, and led us to a point that you're looking at on your screen, which, and I keep showing this image because it's so telling, is the lottery line in Chicago for Illinois cannabis program. So whatever Ehrlichman and them wanted to do at the time is irrelevant. What they ended up doing was creating a circumstance in which that is what the lottery line looks like in America for something that brown people have been incarcerated for, lost their children and jobs for, for decades. But suddenly, if you have the startup capital and the gumption to intend to start a business around it in a newly legalized market, and if you're white, then congratulations, please sign up. So, this has been great. I am shocked that I am under time. <laughs> Personal best. <laughs> and uh, next time, what we have for you is, I'm gonna talk a little bit about process equity, right, um, as opposed to outcomes equity. What does it mean for a process to be equitable? The, um, the importance of using data and being data reliant, but not being data hostage. And then of course, anything else as the board sees fit. So uh, with that, if there are any questions in the room or virtually, I'm more than happy to answer. Otherwise, thank you so much for your time. I've got one. Yeah. In the, the equity impact assessments, who fills out an EIA and how do you bring in outside perspectives to capture this thing? You, know, you think about the, the Tobacco 21 part. If Vermont legislators are all white and we're not aware, then how do you get extra voices in to help them pass those, uh, those things before they write a law that ends up disadvantaging indigenous populations? Yeah, excellent question. I'm going to repeat it in case folks didn't hear it. The question was, who fills out equity impact assessments at the state level, and how do we incorporate um, voices of people with lived experience or from marginalized groups, particularly in a legislative setting when you have people who are writing a bill? Um, and the answer is that at the, in the executive agencies, the people who fill out the equity impact assessment tool are usually the same policy people and budget people who are putting forward the proposal. So if you're a person in your department and you're in charge of, um, I don't know, the clean water policy, right? If you're the person who normally makes proposals, then you're probably the person who's also filling that out. However, you know, it's not, um, it's, it's something that should be a team effort. And so we encourage people to work with each other to, to get the work done. And there's also a sort of regular chain of 
review that happens with proposals before they make their way to governor's office or to the agency of administration. So anyone who's in that chain of reviewing policy proposals is responsible for reviewing and contributing to the EIA. The other thing is that, of course, I always tell them that I'm available to help them if they need that, so there's that, and so is the governor's policy person. And the last thing is we have a team of equity liaisons around the state, which is basically a point person in every agency or department who is an additional point of contact on equity matters. So that person, one of, that, one of their roles in their respective agencies and departments is to uh, assist with the filling out of EIA. Now, that's us in the exec branch. On the legislative side, um, we are aware that a number of legislators have been trying to put together something similar to this. As it's not clear to me that it would be as uh, detailed, but it follows the spirit of an equity impact assessment in the sense that it asks the questions about who are we helping, who are we harming, and how are we getting it done. Now, it is trickier in a legislative context um, because a lot of times, first of all, they're time bound, right? They have their own deadlines and their own process, and this is something that I can work on for an extended time, but session is only a certain length. So timing is an issue, and again, to that I always say, don't anchor your timeline. Anchor the need for what has to get done. And adjust your timing accordingly, because justice doesn't really care what your schedule looks like. The second thing is that, um, and I think those of you in the room who used to be legislative counsel or work in any kind of drafting capacity often understand that sometimes uh, an elected will say, don't tell me we can't do it, just tell me how we're gonna get it done because this is what I want, even if it's, you know, illegal. So, um, so that can be tricky as well, being able to incorporate equity measures into something when a person kind of has it in their mind, of, no, this is what I wanna do. And I'll leave it to you how to, how to handle those situations, but that's a little bit about the process of EIA. Ashley, uh, if you can hear me, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask a question. Um, it's a little bit of a question and a little bit of a statement that we're, I just want to have us all consider when it comes to thinking about equity, especially in cannabis in Vermont, because we are a very different state, because, you know, diversity is, you know, not, you know, as much, I think, as, as other states that we have seen models from, you know, I, I'm curious in what you have noted in the existing cannabis brands and marketing is what you have seen for like women being represented in Vermont, um, people of color being represented in the Vermont cannabis industry as it stands on its own itself. I, I don't want to like have Vermont just like start patting itself on the back for what it's done in its existing market. But I do think for those who are, are perhaps haven't closely been watching what brands exist now to really see that like. 80% of the cannabis brands that are available to customers now in the legal market um, are owned and operated by women. And I think it's already showing that our state is being so um, so sensitive to that issue. I think that we're so unique in the sense that this is such a huge upfront issue for us um, that perhaps you know we may not have all of the numbers and stats for certain demographics of people here in Vermont, I feel like we're doing the best we can with the people that exist here in this, in this industry as a whole. And then the other thing I wanna mention is that, you know, of course we're gonna talk about repercussions as, as it pertains to discrimination, but as someone who has experienced discrimination myself in the cannabis space as it exists in today's market, um, someone telling me that they don't have a problem with my products or my brand or my messaging, but they have a problem with me, you know, what are we going to do to, you know, let people know that there are certain people who exist still in the cannabis industry that feel that way? And how are we going to um, bring those bring those voices to the forefront and punish those who want to keep us um, from being successful and flourishing? Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I will say to your first point, it's really, I'm glad that you highlight the, the sex diversity in the industry because you know, I think oftentimes when people think I'm talking about equity, they assume I'm talking only about racial equity. And just as you note, we are talking about members of the LGBTQIA plus population. We're talking about women identified people. We're talking about people living with disabilities, people experiencing socioeconomic disparity, right? These are all people who in one way or another 
have been oppressed by members of dominant groups in the United States and abroad. And what that means for us is as we can, as we build out this market, um, if we can focus on reducing barriers for all of those groups, everybody is going to benefit, period, end of story, right? And then, you know, there's something, to, there's women-owned and then there's women-owned, right? Or there's Black-owned and then there's Black-owned, right? Did I put something in my sister's name so that I could get this added credit? Or, you know, have I always identified as white my whole life, but for the purposes of this application, yes, in fact, I do have a great, 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 great grandfather who might have been Cherokee, maybe, right? So the ways in which sometimes this system is manipulated um, is also something that we should be looking at, right? And I, I to the last point about um, there being discrimination within the industry and how, how and whether government should respond to that is a really tricky one, right? One thing I always tell people is I'm not here to make people not be racist because it's legal to be racist. It's legal to be a jerk, right? I, I don't intend to stop people for that, but I do intend to ensure that people are being treated equitably across racial groups, right? And so that is an incredibly frustrating and fine line to walk, which is what is the state's role um, in, in feeding that kind of change. And I think Vermont is great because we've this state has always had a sort of, we like local and we like community owned and shared. And you know, it's, there's a certain set of values that I think the state has always stated it values. And this is really the time for us to prove it. Do we love women owned businesses? Okay, great. Well, 80% are here in, in the industry. What are we gonna do to make sure that it's a hospitable environment, right? So I don't think that was much of an answer, but just kind of a ditto. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, agreed. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. I think one thing that uh, you're probably aware of in that earlier presentation is we have to struggle with supporting social equity, which is a founding principle of the legislation, and moving incredibly quickly. And those things often are in direct tension with one another. Yeah. And so anything that you can do to help us try to achieve the purposes or push back on it. Yeah, one of my favorite things to tell the legislature is we need more time. Stop it. So um, if you all find that you need more time with something, I will be happy to shout that <laughs> at whomever will listen. So, um, and I, I say that because, again, timing matters so much, right? Rushed policy is rarely good policy, and it's a waste of everyone's time if we end up with a crappy work product that is just going to keep replicating harm. So, um, yes, absolutely, at your service. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have uh, one agenda item left before our, our final public comment period. Um, we're going to do an ethics um, overview on some very specific topics. Um, are you ready to go? Or we're a little bit early. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, uh, this is Larry Novins. Um, he's a professor at Vermont Law School. Um, he's also the executive director of the Vermont Ethics Commission. Um, Julie Holberg, for those who don't know, is the former chair of the Vermont Ethics Commission. Um, and uh, we thought that it was important. I mentioned some of the concerns that we have around public engagement and kind of accepting gifts um, as, um, as advisory committee members. I think um, Larry, um, we asked him to talk a little bit about, a little bit deeper into those subjects, um, as well as conflicts of interest. Um, you are an advisory capacity. You're not making any binding decisions upon us. So in some ways, um, your personal conflicts, if they do exist and are disclosed properly, are, are kind of how you mitigate that. But I think Larry would probably be more uh, beneficial to hand this over to you before I get out of my depth. Um, okay. Do you mind if I take off my jacket? Please do. This is the first time I've worn a tie in a year and a half. The jacket, the jacket's sort of putting me over the edge. <laughs> I'm waiting for my computer to warm up. 
Um, my job's a little bit different. My job, I think, today is to make you comfortable. <laughs> um, and when I talk about ethics, and most people, when they hear about ethics, they go, oh, God, everybody can tell me what I can't do and how I can get in trouble. And my job is, I think, to tell you how you can avoid trouble and to make your life uh, working with the state of Vermont a little bit easier. There are some common pitfalls that we all sort of are exposed to in, in working in state government. <clears throat> Before I worked at the Ethics Commission, I worked for the Secretary of State for 16 years, and I was counsel to, I don't know, 15 or 16 different licensing boards. So we had a lot of the same issues that you'll face um, in, in your work here. And uh, the bottom line on everything having to do with ethics um, is one, try and keep it simple, and two, try and be transparent about what we're doing. Um, if, if you do that, the rest of it will take care of itself. <clears throat> Excuse me. For some reason, I have this something in the back of my throat that's just driving me nuts. Um, that would be nice. Thank you. I don't think it's going to make a huge difference, but it's nice to have. <clears throat> I can get into my computer. Usually I can do it by the third try. <laughs> And I do have a little PowerPoint if this thing ever turns on that I can share with you. So let me thank you for inviting me here today. I'm appreciative of the opportunity to share with you. I have a little handout of the Ethics Commission I can give you later on um, outlining our current code just by way of background. Uh, when the Ethics Commission was created beginning in 2018, one of their jobs was to adopt a code of ethics for state government. And they did that. And uh, what we realized quickly is it's wonderful, we have a great code, but it doesn't really apply to anybody if they don't want to follow it. And uh, so what we've done is we've introduced, uh, we have a sponsor in the legislature and introduced a revised code, updated code, that hopefully one day will become a law and it will apply to everybody in state government. The idea is it'll make it easier for everybody to know what the expectations are for us in state government. And I understand <clears throat> there are three of you on the board and then the rest, I'm assuming either staff or on the committee, right? The advisory committee. Mm -hmm. And the way the committee is set up is a little bit different because your job is to advise. So some of the things that might be a conflict for you or, or Julie may or may not be a conflict for you. It's sort of a gray area. Some of you were picked because of your work in state government, and that makes it a little bit easier to identify conflicts that may arise here. Some of you come from outside state government, come from private industry or private, the private sector. <clears throat> Thank you. And it's different for you because in your day-to-day -day activities, people are coming to you, there are things that are going on that may or may not affect what you're doing here on the advisory committee. But as long as what you're giving is advice and not really making the concrete decisions, the degree of, of conflict is, is diminished. And so what I'm going to go through today is a brief outline about what is ethics um, <clears throat> and then talk about the things that we spoke about earlier um, that are specific to your job as uh, advisors here. And you'll be glad to know this computer's almost warmed up. <laughs> Why in this enormous empty building did they stick you in one room where you're all on top of each other? <laughs> the next thing is enormous. You could be all spread out all over the place. <clears throat> Yeah, 
Kyle, the resident tech mm -hmm. person. Excuse me, sir. Many wears many hats. Probably <laughs> not. I just thought there was. I don't think a meeting has ever started where it's just like flawless for everybody to get on. <laughs> yeah, once we have it implanted in our brains and we're just chipping in. <laughs> I have not, I think, ever, even at conferences. But no. I'm not good at this. I'm not good at this. <laughs> You're, the speed of your computer is not I probably a couple of Achilles heels, and this is one of them. We'll get it there. Don't worry. Really, the bilateral Achilles heels. <laughs> <laughs> yep. While we do that, why don't I just start? So, um, Potter Stewart, who was on the U.S. Supreme Court in the 50s, had a good definition for it. Ethics and, and basically, it's ethics is it's not doing what you have a right to do; it's doing the right thing. And so, what we're trying to do is try and find the right way or the right thing to do in a state government. Um, what applies to you? You know, as, as the, the people on the board, you are subject to a governor's executive order that tells you the things you have to do. Those of you on the committee may have seen that order and may have had to sign something uh, similar to that order. So that is sort of the prime primary thing that, that should direct your activities on your uh, as you serve here. Um, the big thing, I think the biggest problem that everybody worries about or is concerned about is what happens when there's a conflict of interest. And even before that, what is a conflict of interest? You know, what is what is it a conflict of interest? Basically, everything in state ethics and governmental ethics comes down to one thing. It comes down to our duty to the state of Vermont as employees or board members or people serving the state in one capacity or another, and our own individual interests. And our own interests might be something personal to us, our own financial interests, our own personal interests, or it might be the interest of somebody close to us, a family member, a spouse child, um, our best friend. So what happens frequently is there will be a question that will come up to somebody in state government that involves something that's going to cost them money, or it involves a member of their family, directly or indirectly, or involves somebody else. And that's when the light should come up and go on and say, okay, this is a situation where I need to start asking questions and be aware of how what I'm about to do might affect people or myself that I care about. Um, so we have a, a definition of a conflict of interest. If I ever get the, the rest of the computer going, I can find it, show it to you on the yeah, screen. If you want to find your presentation. Okay, yeah, give me a second. I just gave the um, presenting okay. powers. <laughs> Hopefully everything is always in the last place you look.
Good. Okay. Cooking will get. So I'm going to skip through it. I don't know how you. Okay. Good. So there's the uh, the definition. And here are some sources. So I mentioned earlier, um, the Vermont Constitution is a source of ethics for us all. Um, the Ethics Commission, we have a bunch of stuff on our website. And you can get to that quite easily. I'll give you more information on that easier, uh, later rather. And then um, there's the governor's executive order that I mentioned before and the statute. Um, the ones that affect you most directly probably are the governor's executive order, the uh, Ethics Commission Code of Ethics, which was revised two years ago, and then our proposed statute, which is H384, uh, that was introduced last March. And then probably the DHR uh, personnel policies will not affect most of you directly. <clears throat> so here's what a conflict of interest is. Um, and it's essentially it's an interest, direct or indirect, financial or otherwise, or an interest known to the person regarding somebody close to them, their immediate family, household, business associate, etc., in the outcome of a particular matter pending before you or your body, or something that's in conflict with the proper discharge of your, your duties. So a conflict of interest uh, doesn't mean something where your interest is no greater than anybody else's. You know, for example, taxes. So if you had the power to uh, levy a tax or make a tax rate and it was going to affect you the same as everybody else in the state of Vermont, that would not be a conflict of interest. Okay. Now, what happens when there is a conflict of interest? Ooh, I'm bad at this. Down there. There we go. There we go. Okay. So the general rule is if you have a conflict, if you need to make a decision and it affects you, then you should recuse. You shouldn't participate in that discussion or that decision. So if you were <clears throat> deciding who should get a license for a dispensary in, uh, say, the city of Rutland, and it was your application, that's that easy. You, know, you don't vote on your own application. If it's your best friend from college, probably you don't want to vote on that one either. So you need to ask all these questions. Um, there are times, and Julie asked me this question the other day, well, what if something comes to us as the Cannabis Control Board and all three of us have a conflict of interest. What do we do? You have to make a decision. If, if you all refuse yourself, everything grinds to a halt. You can't do anything. There's something in administrative law called the rule of necessity. And that is if you have to make the decision, then go ahead and do it. But how does the public know that what you're doing is not for your own benefit, not for your own good? How do they know? I mean, what's the one thing we hear all the time when we're talking about government? What's wrong with government? What is it people say all the time? Oh, they're in it for themselves. Or they're in it for their donors. Or they're in it where the money is. Or they're in it for God knows what purpose. But they're not watching out for me. So when you're in a situation where you have to make a decision and you do have a conflict of interest and you can't recuse, you can't give it to somebody else to decide, then your obligation is to disclose the conflict of interest. You say, I want to be open, I want to be on top of things, I want to be transparent, and I'm going to let the world know that I have a conflict of interest, and this is my conflict. This application involves my brother-in-law. This will benefit me financially directly. And there's no way I can recuse. I'm obligated to do this. So then when you vote, when you finally make a decision on something, <clears throat> what you need to do is be very careful to articulate why you are doing what you are. Why is this decision the best for the people in Vermont as opposed to the best for Larry and Ovid? So if you're open and transparent about it, then the people who are out there who will say, they're only in it for themselves, hopefully, will be assured that you're actually doing the right thing for the people of Vermont and not for us, yourself, or 
uh, individuals, so your, yourself as an individual. <clears throat> so one of the questions, well, how do you disclose a conflict? What do you do? Um, sometimes if, if you're in a meeting and it comes up and these things will sometimes come up during a meeting, all of a sudden you, you see the next thing comes before you, whoop, red light, that's a conflict for me. Then you say, I have a conflict on this, um, I need to recuse myself. Or if it's one where you can't recuse, I have a conflict, here's what the conflict is, and here's why I can't recuse or I don't think I need to recuse. And then you, you would give that to the board, um, the board would keep these records. Um, if you did it orally, that would be fine. If you have a written disclosure, conflict disclosure form, you could fill that out. I drafted one that I can give to you all, uh, sort of a, a working draft of what happens when there is a conflict. <clears throat> so that would be a helpful thing to just think about and say, what? Well, okay, so far everything Larry has told us is sort of what to watch out for and what not to do, right? And, and I said, my job is to make you feel better, not worse. Um, the idea of being aware of these things is that if we're open, we're transparent, we disclose any conflicts we have, then the people who are out there and would you know, think that they're in it for themselves are either mollified or assured that actually we're doing the right thing for them. So that's really, really important. Um, so it's identify a conflict of interest, disclose the conflict of interest, and then either refuse or proceed explaining why it's okay for you to proceed. One of the things that you need to worry about is, well, there are sometimes it's not a conflict, but it might look like one. It's an apparent conflict. <clears throat> and it's like, well, that's a little shady. I'm not sure that uh, that's really um, a good thing for them to be involved in. So what you would do is if it looks like a conflict, like there's an application for a license and if somebody has the same last name as me, then I would say, you know what, that looks like a conflict, but I've never heard of this person before. It's a remarkable coincidence that they have the same last name or they live down the road from me, but I've never met them before and I have, I don't think I have a problem with that. As long as you disclose that, then you defuse that criticism. So I think that's really important to know. How do you know when to recuse? You know, when is the right time to recuse and when is the right time to proceed? Something happens to you, you're in a conversation, somebody comes up to you and says, um, gee, you know, I know you're on the advisory board. I'd really like you to, to push for this particular proposal because I think it's great and it's gonna help me as an individual. Um, and your initial thought is to say, well, of course, I want to hear from everybody, and I want to make sure that the, the board hears a diverse range of opinions before they make any decision. In that situation, there are a couple things you can do. One is disclose to the board. I had a conversation with a close friend of mine who shared information about something they were interested in, and I'm giving it to you in that light so you know about it. The other thing to do, and this is what I have told licensing boards in the past, <clears throat> if somebody comes up to you with an idea or with substantive information about something that you know you're going to be voting on in the near future, or you know you're going to be voting on it, I would tell them, don't talk to me about this. We're going to have a hearing on this. Um, if you have any information, give it to the whole board or give it to the whole advisory committee so it's shared. Because if you don't do that, what happens is you end up sort of being the conduit for this person. And then other people say, well, why is committee member X saying this? Where is that coming from? But if you refer to the person, say, talk to the whole board, make your, your comment public, don't go through me. You've done a couple of things. One is you've ensured that they're comment will be heard by everybody, whether it's good or bad. Two, you've avoided that, that you're being made a conduit for that person. And most importantly, I think you have preserved your independence and your impartiality. So what I would say to people who come to me when I need to make a decision is, please don't talk to me. Because if you do, you may lose me as a participant in that conversation. I may not be able to participate if I've sort of gone out on a limb for you 
in this conversation today. So it protects you. It just allows you to do your job as a board member or a committee member better, and it precludes uh, you know, public criticism that somehow you're doing something nefarious. <clears throat> when you're having a conversation about something that may come up in front of the board or the committee, you know, how do you know which one of those conversations is, is going to be problematic? Um, one of the things that we always say is, would you be having this conversation if somebody from VT Digger was sitting there? You know, or your mom was sitting there, or somebody you know, whose judgment or criticism you were really worried about. And if the answer is, I wouldn't be having this conversation if there was a reporter sitting next to me, then that should tell you. you know, tell them to go through channels. Tell them to talk to everybody else. Does this mean you can't talk to your friends anymore? No. Does this mean you, you, know, you can't ever hear anything and, and bring it to the committee or to the board? No, it does but it does ask that you be discreet because as a public servant, as somebody working for the state of Vermont, in this capacity, you're asked to do two things. One is to produce the product that the legislature told you to produce, and the other is to assure the public that you're doing it in a fair, equitable, conscientious way. And hopefully these you know, tips will enable you to do that without any fear of getting sucked into something. Um, the last thing you want to have happen is to read in the newspaper, so-and-so said at a party that, oh, for sure the commission or the committee is going to be doing this. You know, you, you just don't want that. It looks like you've prejudged something. And, you know, as they say, loose lips, same shit. So if people ask you, <clears throat> well, what's the committee going to do next? What are you talking about this week? You know, if it's something that's in the public record, if there's an agenda and, and you say, we have six things on our agenda, here's what we're going to be talking about, that's fine. But if you start predicting or saying, we're going to do this, or we're going to do this, then that, that can be a problem. And I'll, I'll get to later a sort of general list of uh, government ethics um, considerations. So one of the other issues that comes up is a gift, and let me see if I can find this one. Um, okay, this is what I'm going next. So, <clears throat> sometimes in, in government, people want, want to give you things. You know, what's the example? Pop goes into a diner and they say, hey, coffee's on us, or the, to the uh, snow plow driver, coffee's on us. Or somebody comes into your office and brings a nice box of uh, Lake Champlain chocolate. Why do they do that? Is it just because they're nice or because they're hoping that by being friends with you, by being close to you, that you're going to treat them, if not fairly, better than other people? You know, are they trying to curry favor with you? Um, if you see a public, a public person, if you see somebody on the board, if you see a, a committee member, Taking a gift from somebody, what's the first thing the suspect, suspecting member of the public is going to think? There's something behind that. So in our ethics code, um, <clears throat> in our current ethics code and in the proposed code, we have a, a, a section covering gifts. And it says no gifts. Let's see if I have a slide on this. I think I do. Um, and let me know when we're running out of time. I guess I do. Um, it's at the bottom of that. No gifts under circumstances in which it can be reasonably inferred that the gift is intended to influence you in the performance of your official duties or is intended as a reward for anything you've done uh, is allowed. So if somebody gives you a gift where it looks like they're intending to influence you or it's, you did a great job in that vote last week, here's tickets, here are tickets, to the Flynn Theater whenever it opens. That should be a clue that it's wrong. In our proposed code, there are some exceptions to the gift rule um, that were put in there in hopes of making it a little more palatable. But the general rule, and you know, is some gifts, if somebody gives you a gift and it's not intended to influence you and it's not a reward, that may be okay. But what's the easy rule? If somebody gives you a gift, just say no. It's so much easier. 
And and I remember one time I had a a meeting uh, with a a state official, a legal counsel for a state official. We went out for coffee, and we kind of both looked at each other for a minute and said, oh, "We need each to pay for our own." You know, it either would look like I'm trying to influence them or they're trying to influence me. And you know, it, I think a cup of coffee is an extreme example, but I think it's a good example. You know, just be very aware of how it looks. More than anything else, it's the appearance that will get people into trouble. You, you know, look at the news anytime, and somebody will take something that's fairly innocuous and they'll make it look bad. And if you're aware of that and, and you say, I'm just going to be very alert to things that may look bad, you're 99% the way, 99 of the way there to being safe. Can we explore that for a second? Because you were talking earlier about events, attending events, so there might be a free meal. Yeah. Um, what is your thought on that as it relates to guests? Um, it, I, I think, it, well, as in all things, I'm going to say it depends. Uh, you know, if it was there was a meeting of the Agency of Human Services and they had free lunch, there would be a problem. If it's a meeting of an organization that has business before you or wants something from you, then that, that can be a problem. And I think the better thing to do in that situation is I'm happy to attend your meeting. I feel it's probably better if I buy my own lunch. If they're having lunch at some fancy restaurant or fancy hotel someplace and it's a fifty or sixty dollar lunch, you know, it may be sort of tempting to do it and it would be fun to do it. But probably the better thing to do is I'll either get my own lunch or I'll come after lunch or I'll pay for my own. Um, <clears throat> if the board has approved something, that's a little bit different. So if you have special permission to do something, that's one thing. Um, and there is that, that um, clause in the proposed code that if you have permission to do something, <clears throat> and that permission is granted because it's being seen in the public interest, then that's probably okay. But if nothing else, if you take nothing from, from what I have to share with you today, it's always ask. The question. And if you ask the question, then chances are you'll be able to work through and get the answer. Uh, Mark Twain had this thing that, that I had in this presentation, but I took it out. But he said, It's not what you know that'll get you in trouble. It's not what you think that'll get you in trouble. It's what you know for sure. Because chances are, if you're sure, you're wrong. Um, so keep asking the questions and you know, talk to the board. Or feel free to call our office if we can help you. When people call us and ask for guidance on things, it's confidential. We don't tell anybody else. And you know, if, if when I get a call, I can usually help somebody work through the problem and say, okay, here's what the questions are. I think it implicates these ethical issues. Work through, and then 99% of the people reach their own conclusions. They don't need a, a, a yes or a no answer. Larry, we have um, just about five minutes left. Do you mind if I just, I know, I'm sorry, I, I, I know. That's okay. Wait, do you mind if we just pause for questions? Sure, no, I don't mind at all. Continue. Any questions at this point uh, for Larry? Stephanie? <clears throat> Yeah, hi Larry, it's Stephanie Smith with the Vermont Agency of Agriculture and I'm a member of the advi uh, advisory committee um, helping the Cannabis Control Board. Uh, because we're not, uh, the advisory committee is kind of a policy committee, we're not making any quasi-judicial decisions about any, you know, anyone's particular involvement in cannabis market down the road, um, we're more engaged in policy. Does the, the limitation on us being able to speak with the public that you mentioned earlier, or as I am interpreting it, um, sh should we not have those conversations? I would, I, I mean, I, I like to have conversations with the public pretty broadly so that I understand what their concerns are. And I, I just want a little clarification. I think it's a little bit different. I mean, some of the members of your group are already in state government. So technically, you don't have a private or personal point of view to bring to the, the committee or to the board. That the reason you're on the committee is because of your particular expertise in a particular area. So for you, it's less of a risk. I mean, because of where you are in your job, you speak to the public all the time. And we encourage that. We want people to do that. Um, but it's, I think it's just important that when you're talking with the rest of the group, that you be open about where you're coming from. Are you speaking for your agency? Are you speaking for an individual? Are you speaking for, a, you know, a friend? Um, 
And so have all the conversations you want, but just be aware um, of this, you know, of the situation of what you bring back to the board. I think the people who are already in state government, it's much easier because we're already bound either by uh, the executive order or by the DHR policies or by the ethics code to the extent it may apply to individuals. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Perfect, good. Any other questions at this point? Okay. Okay. Um, there's, I have, and I can squeeze this in very quickly. Um, other basic government ethics considerations. So if you have a conflict and you say, I have a conflict of interest that there's uh, something involving my neighbor or somebody in my family, um, I can't say to Julie, Julie, here, you do this, um, and I want you to vote for me because it's my brother-in-law, and I really want to see this happen. So you can't delegate a conflict. Um, <clears throat> I think everybody knows in, in state government we're not to give preferential treatment or seek preferential treatment. We don't give somebody treatment because of their friends or their status or anything else. Um, we can't use our position for personal gain. You can't walk into a party and say, hi, I'm from the Cannabis Control Board, um, you know, and I'd like to talk to you, and oh, that's a great looking uh, pile of cookies over there. You know, can I have one? Don't use your position <laughs> for your own personal gain. Um, confidential information, it may be, and I, I suspect for the advisory committee people, this is less likely to happen. You may have some confidential information. Just remember that not only does it need to remain confidential, but if you want to make things worse, disclose that or use it to your own benefit. You know, the situation you see something on your computer and you go, oh, that's great. I want to save that and use it. Can't do it. Um, government resources. You know, anything that you have at the office, you can't go to your, your, your copy machine and copy your wedding invitation. Um, <coughs> Gifts, we talked about briefly, they can be problematic. Um, statements obligating the state of Vermont. Um, if you're not authorized to speak for your organization, whether it be this board or anybody else, don't say, you know, don't give a newspaper interview. Don't say, well, I'm on the, the committee and this and this and this is what we're going to do. Um, that, that can be a problem. There is something in most government uh, ethics about post government employment revolving doors. So if you it won't apply to you. I don't think it applied to anybody in the committee. It's not anything you need to worry about right now. Um, and just the other thing is in our proposed ethics code, there are some whistleblower protections that if you blow the whistle on something that's unethical, uh, you're not, you shouldn't be able to suffer or shouldn't suffer any harm or reprisal. That's basically it. So summary um, in the little eating video little time that we have is just be aware of what the issues are. Ask the questions, discuss them with your colleagues, refer to the sources we have above, or call us, ask for guidance, um, look at our website, and that's that's essentially it. I have some little handouts for you, and I have a, a sample disclosure form that I can give you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much for your willingness to do that. I know that we rushed you, but. Uh, uh, we're very grateful for your information. Um, and yes, I think that uh, this last slide is very important. If you feel like you do have a conflict or one starts to arise with your work, please reach out to Larry, please reach out to Bryn, and we'll figure out um, how to mitigate it, how to deal with it, how to recuse if necessary, et cetera. So I think that's um, great advice. Thank you for being here. Once again. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So you know where we are. Feel free to go. Um, the final thing on our agenda today before we adjourn is one more public comment period. Um, we'll do it the same way that we did earlier. If you have a public comment, if you're a member of the public and you'd like to say something to the whole advisory committee, please feel free to raise your virtual hand. And if you joined uh, by the phone, um, you can unmute yourself by hitting star six. Okay. Oh, you got one. Oh, okay. Jeffrey. 
Thank you, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll be brief. I know everyone wants to wrap up. So thank you uh, for this final opportunity for public comment. Um, I want to thank Susanna, Larry, and others that spoke today. Um, I want to make just a couple of very brief points, um, if you don't mind, uh, surrounding race and cannabis, and then also on licensing equity. Um, just want to bring it back around, really, and underscore uh, Susanna's presentation. Um, we did not catch the audio on that Clark experiment, but uh, I am aware of it. Um, that is something that my friend and colleague Mark Hughes of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, a member of our Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition here in Vermont, mentioned uh, and brought up in his training for our coalition back when we formed. Um, I just want to underscore that it's important for uh, white people to be aware of that study. Um, and if you are unfamiliar with it or did not catch it when she was presenting it earlier, I urge you to seek it out on the internet. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, as we talk about social equity, uh, licensing, market access, uh, enforcement in the adult use space, I just want to take a moment and remind everybody listening that racial disparities in arrest rates persist and even have sometimes increased in states with commercial cannabis marketplaces, something for us to keep in mind. Um, Leafly's social equity research arm recently reported, as of I think a couple months ago, that um, states with commercial marketplaces uh, see a um, four times arrest rate for black and brown people compared to white people. They are four times more likely to get arrested in states with commercial cannabis marketplaces than white people. Uh, and in fact, in LA County, back when California f first legalized, their uh, black uh, arrest rates went up momentarily. They went up when they legalized cannabis. Um, I say that for a reason. Uh, when we speak with um, advocates, organizers, and regulators in other states, notably Massachusetts and Oregon, uh, with active and mature marketplaces, they always tell us to avoid compartmentalizing social equity. Uh, avoid compartmentalizing that. If you do, you uh, find yourselves in poor outcomes. What I mean by that is uh, land and capital uh, are necessities. They are necessities for black and brown people and social equity uh, in the emerging cannabis space. Um, racism is systemic. Uh, it must be dealt with in a systemic nature. Um, that's something that we don't want in, to repeat in Vermont. Uh, again, speaking to Massachusetts, our friends often point out that consumption is really important in the crux of a lot of these arrest rates. Uh, black home ownership is uh, often uh, unbalanced and, 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 and uh, the polar opposite of, of where we want things to be. Uh, I understand Vermont's a little bit different. Uh, we're not as diverse, but we still need to address these issues. Um, something that Mark likes to bring up is uh, less than 1% of all farms in Vermont are owned by uh, people of color. Less than 1%. And nationally, uh, of all of the cannabis businesses um, in every single state, less than 4% are owned by people of color. So just keep this in the back of our minds as we move forward. You guys are at a pivotal point. I wanted to put that on everyone's radar. Uh, very briefly, lastly, re regarding licensing, I just want to stress equity and innovation when you guys are thinking about licensing. It's a popular myth that cannabis licenses must be issued on a limited basis and that a points-based or a lottery system are the only methods for defining parameters for eligibility. Um, other states show that doing so will create, uh, again, in inequitable outcomes. Um, do we want that in Vermont? Um, for, uh, yeah. we, um, thank you for those points. Uh, sure. They're all valid. And uh, we will have opportunities for future public comment on all of these issues. Thanks, Jim. Is there, yeah. Is there anyone else uh, that would like to provide public comment? If you do, please just raise your virtual hand. Okay, um, anyone uh, from the advisory committee would like to make any concluding remarks? Any, any questions? Okay, well, we do have, um, Larry brought a few handouts. There's actually some good detail about gifts and gift taking and receiving on there. Um, we do have a sample um, disclosure form. We'll photocopy these for the benefit of the people um, that join via the link and, and get them out to you. Um, 
it's, this is a really exciting endeavor, and I'm really glad that you're all willing to do this. I know this is a long day. Um, it, we won't be doing this like this again, hopefully. It will be very judicious with how we use your time. We know it's valuable, and we know that you were brought here for your specific expertise. Um, we had to do some kind of housekeeping and orientation things today, but um, I'm really excited that you all accepted this uh, responsibility and um, are taking it seriously. So thank you all. And thanks to everyone who joined via the link. Um, I think that's it. I would take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.